Greetings, Dr. Beckett. Welcome to the Quantum Leap Podcast. Theorizing that one could time travel within his own lifetime, Dr. Sam Beckett led an elite group of scientists into the desert to develop a top-secret project known as Quantum Leap. Pressured to prove his theories or lose funding, Dr. Beckett prematurely stepped into the project accelerator. He awoke to find himself in the past, suffering from partial amnesia and facing a mirror image that was not his own. Fortunately, contact with his own time was maintained through brainwave transmissions with Al, the project observer, who appeared in the form of a hologram that only Dr. Beckett can see in here. Trapped in the past, Dr. Beckett finds himself leaping from life to life, putting things right that once went wrong and hoping each time that his next leap will be the leap home. You are listening to the Quantum Leap Podcast. This is episode 28, Maybe Baby. Suddenly, this leap was beginning to feel like Bonnie and Clyde, and a baby. She sees you as you, Sam. Well, she can see you too, Adam. Of course. All babies and animals can see me, and blondes with very low IQs. Maybe I'm here to change a baby. I wish it was that simple. What do you mean? According to Ziggy, there's a 75 point... 6% chance that you're here to return Christy to her father. Well, if they were never married and Rita's her father... Bunny's not Christy's mother. And that means that you two are kidnappers. Hello and welcome back to the Quantum Leap Podcast. I'm Albie. And I'm Heather. Today we have a great show. I know I always say that, but for real this time. (laughs) We're talking about Season 2, Episode 20 of Quantum Leap, Maybe Baby. It's the one where Sam's an unwitting kidnapper. With a gold tooth. Yeah, I got a gold tooth. <clears throat> and we have a great interview with Sean O'Banion. Uh, he's a movie producer, and he's been an assistant on a whole bunch of movies and personal assistant to stars. But he has an interesting story of how he got in the show business, and it might have a little bit to do with Quantum Leap. So that's coming up later in the show. Awesome. First impressions, Heather. You know, I really liked this episode because I didn't know who to believe the whole episode, and that was kind of cool. I kind of figured she was telling the truth because Sam's reasoning, where he's like, why would I be here to reduce their prison sentence? But she was a compulsive liar. It made it interesting because you didn't have any reason not to believe the lawyer. So I like that aspect of it, where you weren't really sure, very gone girl-ish, where you didn't know who to believe. (laughs) You really never know who to believe. Yeah. What's your opinion on the reason why Al said she couldn't be trusted because she was a stripper and strippers always lie and everything they do is a lie? I feel like he has some serious stripper baggage. Velvet in Reno. (laughs) But I mean, he seemed a little bitter towards strippers in general. I think he fell for a stripper maybe and didn't realize that it was an act that he was watching and paying for. I think it probably went further than just the stripper aspect. Like, I think that they probably had a relationship and she Uh, screwed him over. She wasn't always very truthful. Bunny (laughs) O'Hare was definitely a compulsive liar, but I think she had a good heart, so. Uh, See, that was the thing. Uh, Was she Bunny O'Hare or was she Thelma Lou Dickey? Because I think Thelma Lou Dickey probably is not a liar. But I think Bunny O'Hare, her character, she's a character, so she can be anybody she wants to be. So I think that's why she's used to making herself up to other men. So I think that's why it's so easier for her to lie. Well, also, you've seen, I'm sure, in lots of other TV and movies that people usually lie 
because they don't think that someone will like them for who they are. So this is a new relationship for her. And she's stealing a baby. (laughs) I mean, so she probably lied just to kind of get him to go along with all this. Yeah. This is, uh, they've been together a week, so maybe their third date, they steal a baby? Two weeks. Two weeks. Oh, okay. So they've been together two weeks. They are in L-O-V-E. At first glance, it looks a little bit like uh, the trailer for Raising Arizona. Yeah, I don't know what that is. So you think strippers are like an honest group overall? No, they all lie. <laughs> no, I I have nothing against strippers. <laughs> are you waiting for me to like talk about my mom? <laughs> I didn't say anything. <laughs> no, I, I hey man, they make a lot of money. I wish I could make that much money in one night. I will set up the PayPal links. <laughs> What was your first impression of the episode? I really liked it. I remembered this one from watching it when I was a kid. And at the time, I really liked Julie Brown. She was an MTV VJ and she's a comedic actress and she's a writer. But that was always the excitement for me in this episode was Julie Brown was in it, a guest star that I knew who it was. And she was a stripper. That didn't hurt. I have nothing against strippers at the moment. Horrible. (laughs) Horrible. But I thought it was a cute episode. It's uh, fun. I always like the road trip episodes. They have a bunch of those in Quantum Leap, and a lot of them take place in a soundstage in a truck or a car in the dark. But I enjoy that. It's almost like a play. Yeah, the truck seemed a little familiar. It did, didn't it? I'm sure we'll talk about that and much, much more after the episode recap. This is Season 2, Episode 20, Maybe Baby. Original broadcast date, April 4th, 1990. Written by Julie Brown and Paul Brown, and directed by Michael Zinberg. Sam leaps in to find himself climbing out of a second-story window at night, carrying a basket. A woman on the ground urges for Sam to hurry up. Sam climbs down a ladder, and the two of them get into a waiting pickup truck with the basket, as a man appears at the window and shouts at Bunny as he watches them drive away. Behind the wheel of the pickup... Sam is stunned when the woman reaches into the basket and picks up a crying baby girl. It's March 11, 1963, in Texas, and Sam has leaped into a bouncer named Buster. The woman beside him is a stripper named Bunny O'Hare, and the baby's name is Christy. They are headed to Clayton, New Mexico, where Bunny says Christy will be safe with her Aunt Margaret. Sam is nervous about what the two of them are doing, but is relieved to discover that Christy is Bunny's daughter, He assumes that he must be there to get Bunny and Christy to safety. Back at the house, Sam and Bunny took Christy from. Christy's father, Reed Dalton, is reporting the kidnapping to Sheriff Barnes and Deputy Sheriff Sutton. Reed tells them that Bunny talks about his daughter like she's her own and says that he dated Bunny for a while and that his wife died a year ago while giving birth to Christy. Sam and Bunny check into a roadside motel with Christy and Bunny leaves to get Christy some fresh milk. Al arrives and tells Sam that Bunny's real name is Thelma Lou Dickey, and she and Buster work at the same club. Al explains that Bunny and Reed were never married, which means that Christy is not Bunny's daughter. After Bunny returns with Christy's milk, Al tells Sam that in the original history, Bunny and Buster were arrested for kidnapping, and Christy was returned to Reed. Sam believes that Bunny is telling the truth about being Christy's mother, and he must be there to get Bunny and Christy to New Mexico so they can stay together. After Al leaves, Sam asks Bunny who Christy really belongs to. She still claims that Christy is hers, but when Sam presses her to tell the truth, she starts to cry and admits that she lied to him. She tries to tell Sam that the rest of what she said is true, and they have to get Christy to New Mexico, where her real mother is. But Sam doesn't believe her. Bunny says that when Reed found out Bunny had been communicating with Christy's mother, he started hitting and threatening her. She tells Sam that her father used to hit her mother before he started hitting her, and she doesn't want the same thing to happen to Christy. The next morning, Sam and Bunny are back on the road with Christy. Meanwhile, Reed is still on Bunny's trail, assuring Sheriff Barnes that Bunny is headed to New Mexico with Christy. Sam says he wants to stop at a store in the next town and get a proper car seat for Christy. In the store, the man behind the counter recognizes Bunny. Al arrives and tells Sam that Christy's real mother is dead. Sam still believes Bunny's story and asks Al to check for a woman named Margaret Dalton in Clayton. But Al finds nothing. Sam suddenly sees a sheriff's car and the man who recognized Bunny is talking to the police officer. 
Al urges Sam to turn himself in, but Sam refuses, escaping through the back of the store with Bunny. Sam uses some of Bunny's money to buy a car from a local, and he and Bunny drive away with Christy. In the car, Sam notices that Christy is having trouble breathing and realizes she has asthma. He insists that they need to take Christy to a doctor, but Bunny tells him that they can't go back to the last town, so they continue on and find a veterinarian instead. The vet examines Christy, but doesn't have anything she can prescribe for a human. Sam has an idea and fills up Christy's bottle with coffee, telling Bunny that the caffeine will help Christy to breathe until they can get her some proper medicine. Later that night, Christy is asleep in the back of the car. Sam passes a saloon, offering a $50 prize in an amateur talent show. He tells Bunny that they're going to need more gas in the car to make it to Clayton, but Bunny realizes that they've run out of money. They go back to the saloon, and Bunny performs a striptease on stage, winning the talent show and the $50. Al arrives and is upset to have missed the show. As Sam and Bunny celebrate, Sheriff Barnes and Deputy Sheriff Sutton enter, closely followed by Reed. The sheriffs hold Sam and Bunny at gunpoint, and Reed takes Christy back from Bunny. Sam tries to convince the sheriffs that he and Bunny are trying to take Christy back to her real mother, but Reed responds that her mother is dead. Sam learned from Reed that Bunny was never Christy's babysitter, despite what she told Sam, and Sam is disappointed to hear that Bunny lied to him again. Al tries to tell Sam that Bunny has been telling the truth about Christy's real mother from the beginning, but Sam no longer believes it. Bunny steals the deputy sheriff's gun and points it at him, and despite Reed trying to shoot at them with his own gun, she and Sam manage to escape with Christy once more. Outside the saloon, Sam and Bunny escape in the sheriff's car. Reed follows them out and steals another man's car at gunpoint. As Sam and Bunny cross the state line into New Mexico, Al tells Sam that Reed is coming after them. He also explains that Reed is wanted in New Mexico for scamming real estate investors out of millions of dollars. Reed's real surname is Cole, and Al and Ziggy found a woman named Margaret Cole living in Clayton. Margaret got sole custody of Christy after her divorce from Reed, but Reed took Christy and fled to Texas. Sam and Bunny enter Clayton, with Reed less than a mile behind them. Bunny uses the radio in the sheriff's car to give the police Margaret's address so they can arrest Reed when he follows them there. Sam pulls over in front of Margaret's house, but Reed has caught up with them. Local police from Clayton arrive, and Reed tells the sheriff to arrest Sam and Bunny. However, the sheriff recognizes Reed and arrests him instead. Bunny doesn't want to give Christy up yet, but Sam tells her that Christy is home now. As Margaret watches from her open doorway, Sam convinces Bunny, who has started to cry, to give Christy back to her mother. As Margaret holds Christy and smiles, Sam puts a comforting arm around Bunny and leaps. And that episode recap was from Phil. Thanks, Phil. So, what were the big topics in this episode? Were there any? Compulsive lying? (laughs) (laughs) Lying's not good, but... It did serve Bunny well because she got what she wanted by lying. If she told Buster slash Sam that she was not the mother, just a girl who dated a guy once, let's steal the baby. Probably not as likely. No. Um, I think there was some, like, domestic violence going on. Yeah, that was an element to it. Bunny seemed a little damaged. She, uh, as soon as uh, Sam got close to her, she was saying, please don't hit me, please don't hit me. Yeah, she had some issues, huh? Yeah, like she went from zero to 100 in uh, two seconds. She was very immature also. And uh, not so good with the math. Well, yeah. (laughs) I know this probably is such a small detail, but I definitely car seat safety. (laughs) Yeah, I'm glad Sam brought it up. Yeah, I actually didn't expect that from him because he hasn't cared that nobody's been wearing seatbelts. And his argument that she could fly out of the car goes for every single episode that they're not wearing seatbelts. Including this one. Did it, were there seatbelts in the car? Because what were they going to attach the car seat to so she wouldn't fly out of the car? I have no idea about that specific make or model of truck, but I didn't see any shoulder belts hanging down from the side. I looked. So it might have just been lap belts oh, back maybe. then for a bench seat in a truck. But a lap belt will still keep you more in the truck than no seatbelt. Yeah. I just was like, what would they even attach it to? Because, yeah, having her in a car seat is fine as long as it's actually attached to whatever they're in. 
Yeah, car seat safety was crazy in this episode, so... uh I'm glad that they touched on it, and I'm glad that Al had said something like, look at how flimsy these car seats are. And that was in the 90s, and they were still pretty flimsy. It definitely looked like a 70s high chair, just the top of it. Well, in the 90s, I remember... I know this is in the 60s where that was the car seat, but in the 90s, I remember there was like a big bar that came down. Like you were strapped in to the bar and then that strapped in to the seat. Like I remember that as a kid, like my arms resting on the car seat. So obviously I was in a car seat for a while if I remember putting my arms like. But it wasn't attached well and it was in the front seat. That was not the same car seat as what I'm talking about. I mean, when I was older, I had a car seat in the back seat, so. It's it's one of my, my passions in life to be up on car seat safety. I it's guess. good to have a hobby. Yeah. It's a safe hobby, it's right? It's a great <laughs> hobby. I love that you love learning about all that stuff. I mean, I'd rather be safe than sorry, you know? All my friends think I'm crazy, but that's fine. My kid's safe in the car, though. So <laughs> there's always that. Can we talk about the fact that the baby is not a year old? <laughs> there's definitely a, a problem with the episode because Reed says twice that Margaret died in childbirth a year ago. He didn't say last year. Right. He said a year ago. Last year would have worked out because it could have been three months, six months, but a year ago is 12 months. How old was that baby? I'm going to say like six to nine months. And then Bunny, who is a liar, said that she'd been watching the baby for six months, but she's a liar. So who knows what if that's true. But second of all, if the baby is from like six to nine months old, especially in the 60s, why is the baby getting one bottle a day of milk and not any food? She had coffee. But I mean, she I didn't say milk. She, <laughs> she had one bottle. You see her have two bottles, right? Mm-hmm. In the entire. Well, there's one at the end. She's kind of drinking coffee whatever. with cream. It looked like. I, yeah, I don't know. Um, It looked kind of orange to me. But oh, really? oh. <laughs> I was thinking coffee with two creamers and one sugar. When I was a baby, I was born in 89. So when I was a baby, I was getting baby food at three months old. Okay, so that's in the 90s. So in the 60s, I'm pretty sure they started that even earlier. Like, I'm sure that that came from somewhere. Now you don't start baby food to like six months old. But even now, (laughs) that six to nine month old baby that's right there who had small pajamas on should have at least had more food than one bottle a day. Like the poor baby was probably starving. Did they have formula back then? In the 60s? I know they had uh, formula in the 50s. My mom told me stories about my first brother. and they weren't. It was not formula. Well, she made her own. What we, they were told to do was to take caro syrup and condensed milk, mix them together, and that was the baby formula. Or evaporated milk. Evaporated milk and corn syrup. Either way. Milk and corn syrup, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's why my brother now has diabetes. Well, there's corn syrup solids in formula, too. I don't know anything about formula. (laughs) Anywho, that was pretty silly. But my whole point is, is it's probably because I'm watching this as a mom. Because I'm sure a few years ago when I watched this, I wouldn't notice any of this stuff. I would have been like, that was a great episode. Let's go. But as far as the baby's concerned, poor kid is like ignored half the episode. And she's just like left on the bed. (laughs) Like, hopefully she doesn't roll over. Kids always roll off the bed at that age. Well, but she's treated as if she's a newborn when she's at least six months old. And the dad keeps saying a year ago. So there's some inconsistencies with that. And then my other problem, I'm going to skip to the end of the episode. My other huge pet peeve with this episode is the fact that at the end, the mom's just like, oh, thanks for my baby. Yay. Oh my God, no. If my child was away from me for two freaking days, I would be like (gasps) running to my child and like embracing them. She was just like, oh, gentle kiss on the forehead. It's great that you're back. How lovely. Mm Mm-mm, lady. I don't care if it was the 60s. You get your kid back after however long, at least six months your kid has been gone. Most of her life she's been gone from you. And that's the way that you react all proper. Mm, I'm sorry. But that actress was not a mom. Possible reasons. In the 60s, people drank a lot. I don't She didn't look like an alcoholic there, buddy. She, she might have been shooting Pitocin. <laughs> what? No, I'm pretty sure that the actress was not a mom and nobody said anything. I mean, she looks happy and she looks like she's fake crying a little bit. But like she's holding her like she's never held a baby before. Bunny is embracing Christy like, I don't want to give her up. And that's the way that the mom should be 
embracing the child, like hugging the baby by the time. Now, I know that she hasn't been with her a while, but it's your kid. She should have been even more emotional than Bunny was. Right. I don't know, a grieving mom who lost her kid and it's finally back and she was just like, lovely, this is amazing. We don't know for sure if it was the actress because, of course, she's directed by the director. And the director was a guy and who knows if that's the way he wanted her to play it. And she was fighting, no, it wouldn't be like that. It would be like this. And he's the director. So you don't know. And, of course, there's an editor. You are just trying to cover your butt in case we ever interview her. No. But I'm just saying. (laughs) I'm just saying there's a lot of people responsible from the time it's written to getting it on the screen who could interfere in that process. But I agree with you 100%. Totally be more passionate is what I'm saying. (laughs) Okay. And ran. I'd say if I had to classify this episode as a big moral issue episode or a just a fun romp, I would go with romp. Oh, yeah. I mean, they did stick in the thing about disposable diapers in there how they were really bad for the environment back then. Yeah, but then she's wearing one, so. <laughs> she was. She was... Uh, you didn't even catch that at first. No, not at all. I guess you just see babies with diapers on, so you don't think about it. Well, it was funny because he, like, looks down like she pees, and I'm like, she was totally wearing a diaper under <laughs> that towel. Maybe it wasn't a good diaper, but it was. It looked like a disposable diaper that had not been invented yet. Yeah, unless it was, like, those pants, but I think it was just an oops because yeah. the look on his face. He never says she peed on him, but... But it's definitely that look like you're the first McFly in America and you peed on me. (laughs) Well, I liked the skin to skin to calm the baby down. I'm sure that wasn't his intention, but he had to take his shirt off because it had pee on it. But that's what calms babies. That always works. Take your shirt off, hold the baby close. I think I remember the nurse telling you that in the hospital and you were like, (laughs) what? (laughs) Take my shirt off. (laughs) I don't even take my shirt off to go in the pool. (laughs) You're a weirdo. I'll be so weirdo, guys. Mm -hmm. I think that it was weird how they portrayed strippers in this episode. You mean wearing clothes while they strip? No. Well, (laughs) and balloons. Only on TV do strippers wear clothes. I don't get that. I try not to see strippers. I have the opposite opinion. (laughs) Well, my mom used to strip when I was young. Well, no, most of my life. But my mom was a single mom and it was the fastest way to get money, I guess. I don't know this for sure, but is it weird that I've seen your mom naked? Probably. Yeah, you prob- most of the county is probably. <laughs> she doesn't anymore. It's been a really long time. But Does that give you any insight, a special insight to this episode? No, <laughs> I don't think so. I never wanted to associate my mom with that, but I've never been ashamed of it either. I mean, it is what it is. She just was, she paid our bills and she, unfortunately now it, it, had ill effects on her because she has a lot of addiction issues that she has to work through now. Um, And I feel like that kind of comes with that profession because you're in that kind of environment. And I think that you have to go into a different place to be degraded by men like that. I mean, it's not a degrading job, but I feel like men don't treat you as humans when you're doing that kind of profession because it's just a weird, it's like a whole weird situation. I don't know. I never approved or disapproved of my mom doing it because yeah, when I was in high school, I she did it for a little while just because she had to. And if it was between that and serving, she probably made more money stripping in one night than she would serving. So there's a lot of money in that. Yeah. So I ended up with a roof over my head and bills paid. And I, why do I, what do I care <laughs> if that's what my mom has to do? I mean, it is hard work. And we even watched that documentary with Lisa Ling. I wasn't even really paying attention in the beginning and then I started to, but a lot of them are moms and they're doing what they have to for their kids. And you either work four or five shifts at a restaurant or one shift dancing. And you end up spending more time with your kids. I don't think that there's anything wrong with stripping and I feel like it was weird that they portrayed her as damaged and lying because I feel like... That's like a stereotype almost. Right. But... At the same time, she's the one who saved the baby and brought her to her mom. So it was an interesting portrayal because I really think that being a stripper doesn't make you a bad person. No, I dated a stripper. So that was an interesting time for you. (laughs) Um, Very nice person. Yeah. I mean, I, I, again, I have nothing against my mom, but I know that you were probing me to bring that up earlier. So I figured I would say something. Uh, It's just anytime Rennie takes her diaper off, I say, oh, it's in the genetics. Yeah, she's going to get older and start questioning that (laughs) Hopefully she doesn't still take her diaper off when she's older. Well, 
Right. Yeah. I mean, I love my mom and I wish that she didn't have to do that when we were growing up, but also that was all her choice. So, but I, I feel like a distinct memory of when I was, I think I was like a sophomore or junior in high school and it was in the summer. We were staying with my dad for the summer, which is weird all on its own and in Indiana and she was stripping just to have money in the summer because it's not, doesn't necessarily have to be a long-term job. And she came home and woke me up and like threw money on me and was like, look at all the money I made. And I was like, ew, why did you just do that? That's the grossest thing ever. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I don't, it's very strange. (laughs) Two strippers. Oh, good for you. I've never dated a male stripper. Unless you're... (laughs) I can start. Hey, money. There's money in that, right? Mm -hmm. Your uncle was a male stripper. He was. Weirdly, my mom and my uncle actually stripped at the same place. (laughs) It was a really weird family. Hopefully they don't listen to this. (laughs) Weird. I was like two when all that happened, so it was a long time ago. she threw stripper money on you when you were two? No, no, that was recent. I met with my uncle. Oh, okay. (laughs) My uncle is now a pretty successful businessman, so maybe he's only stripping in his downtime now. It's a workout. I saw Magic Mike. So did I. We were there there opening night. (laughs) Yes, we were. Speaking of her being a liar, she lied a lot about the stupidest things. About like five times. Uh, Probably more. Almost like she was a little kid afraid of getting caught. Well, like lied about having a sister than not having a sister, but... Some of them, I don't even know what was true because like we don't know if she had a sister or not or if she was really telling why she went to reform school or you kind of doubted almost everything she said because, you know, she's 26, but she's really 30. And I have in the past lied about my age. Yes, you have. And uh, the number I picked was 26. I don't know if that's popular or not. What's funny is I am 26, literally 26. Or are you lying about your age? No, I was born in 1989, literally 26. I lied to you about my age. Yes, you did. Because you were 18, 19? 19. 19. And I said, I'm 26, which to a 19-year-old sounds old. But I was really like, what, 32? But I said, no, you're not. I didn't believe you even then. You were 30, 34. I was 34. So sometimes lying does work, though. I don't think I dated you because you said you were 26. Because Mike, the manager at the time, was like, he's not 26. I don't know what I was thinking. (laughs) (laughs) bad judgment call on my part no i'm just kidding so not a lot happened in the episode really well what's weird is i feel like they added the veterinarian scene in there to take up more time of the episode is that weird because i feel like there was no point in them stopping like they're on the run and yes she's wheezing but like unless she turns blue keep running away from the police like i don't i understand that like her having trouble breathing was a thing but she's been having trouble breathing the whole episode and for the past few weeks according to bunny right there was no imminent danger as long as you kept an eye on her i feel like they could have kept driving and then they stop at the veterinarian's office and nothing happens no medicine they just stopped and wasted time that veterinarian's office looked a little familiar i thought as soon as i saw it how the test was won yeah it looked a lot like that house Yeah. And we might see that house again in a future episode, so be on the lookout. And I don't even notice that kind of stuff, so it must have been really obvious. It was the same room. Yeah. And I don't even think they changed the decorations. Like, (laughs) I think it was literally the same room. They were like, well, it's a veterinarian office again, so we might as well just set the same stuff up again. I'll just add the canister of bull sperm and we'll be fine. That's a good (laughs) rule to go by any (laughs) time. I loved his uh, double take on bull sperm. He like goes, oh, bull sperm, puts it down and goes, what? What bull sperm? I just feel like it was, and and I know that they add that kind of stuff, but it would have been more practical if they had like a flat tire. I feel like stopping at the vet was such a weird thing to do. I think it was to show off that he's a medical doctor again. I know, but like come up with it. My eye, if I wrote it, I would have been like, not that I'm saying anything bad about the writers that we're going to interview later. But I feel like I would have had them have a flat tire or something happen at the gas station. They didn't even stop at the gas station to get gas. So like they cut out the gas station scene, but left in the vet scene, which I feel was completely unnecessary. It's because they already did the gas station scene in another road trip episode, Starcrossed. But I mean, like something could have happened at the gas station to hold them up. 
Uh, that whole thing about uh, caffeine for asthma, is that a true thing? A bronchodilator? Caffeine is a drug that is very similar to theophylline. Theophylline is a bronchodilator drug that is taken to open the airways in the lungs and therefore relieve the symptoms of asthma, such as wheezing, coughing, and breathlessness. That might be why I don't have asthma. Yeah. <laughs> I did have asthma as a baby. I was in one of those little oxygen tents for a long time. Were you? Yeah. And uh, my first meal as a baby was French fries and Coca-Cola in my bottle, which my mom was not too happy with my dad about. So I'm sure that had caffeine. So that didn't help my asthma. I feel like you were the fifth child. So <laughs> I feel like they were not as strict with you as they would have been with the first child. My mom was pretty upset. Yeah, I would have been. I think I told you, like, don't pull that with me. I might have snuck her a couple of fries. You were so excited when she could have a French fry. Like, why would you want to start her on that journey? <laughs> that's true. What's funny is she doesn't even really like fries, so that's fine. <laughs> She's like, no, please pass the apple slices. <laughs> we have a good kid. I loved that Big Bob, played by Ray Young, was overweight. To my knowledge that I can remember, this is the first heavy set person on Quantum Leap. Really? Do you, can you think of someone? Ah, uh, no. He kept having to pee on the road trip a lot. The sheriff called him Gotta Go Joe. Yeah, I feel like he had diabetes. Oh, probably. Drinking too much, peeing too much, overweight. But I think the reason they did that is I can't remember a shot of the sheriff's car driving on the road. Every time they cut to the sheriff and Reed and the deputy, they were just parked. It might have been like a logistical thing. Well, it also slowed them down because you couldn't have the one slowed down without the other slowed down. We're in hot pursuit. Get, get, get. But you got to pee. Yeah. So we were talking about that truck earlier. It looked a lot like the truck from Freedom. And I think from the circus episode, too. Yeah, just different colors. So somebody might like that particular model of truck or maybe it's just a redressed truck. Yeah, probably redressed. I feel like it would be cheap to just keep using the same truck. But three episodes in a row, Freedom leaping in without a net and maybe baby with the same style kind of pickup truck in it. Maybe that was just for anybody who was paying attention to test us, see if we were noticing. I love the music in this episode. It has a really good soundtrack, a lot of good stuff. And I like the fact that the characters, Bunny and Sam, were singing along here and there, so they couldn't really replace the music. Yeah, I'm sure Velton Ray Bunch was glad about that one. <laughs> the PU skunk toy is funny to me because I swear it's a dog toy. Because <laughs> it squeaks, right? Yeah. Baby toys don't squeak. Not really. Unless they're on TV. Well, they do kind of, but... Yeah. Some of them, but I feel like it looked like a dog toy and it was a skunk, like with the most random baby toy. But whatever a baby likes and keeps it calm, you, right. you, you give it to them. It could have been the dog toy that kept her calm. Kids are like that. They don't, they don't play with what you want them to. They, they play with what they like. They're like, no, I'd rather play with this piece of cardboard. Thanks. $50 toy? No, I'm good with the box. They made a lot of bunny jokes in this with the uh, harebrained scheme. And yeah. it's just funny that her name was Bunny O'Hare. I think Phil made a joke in his recap on Bunny's Trail. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot Good of Bunny Good one, things. Phil. <laughs> it was funny because when I saw the preview for the episode, when we recorded the last show, I thought she was stealing her baby from the baby daddy. That was my assumption going into this episode. Then I kind of, when they got to the hotel and she didn't bring milk, I was like, I don't know about that. I thought that she had a guy on the side. Like Buster was her boyfriend and he was rescuing her from Reed. That was my assumption. And then she didn't bring the milk. I was like, that's weird. So the first time I was watching it, I thought it was funny and like funky like that. Because if you're the mom, like, and she's like, well, you didn't think of it either. And I wanted to be like, he's not the mom. Weird. But I'm glad that she wasn't just stealing a random child. <laughs> what, was the, what was your thought? Like, do you remember... Well, you obviously remember this episode because you like it, but... My only memory of this is being a kidnapping episode, so I knew going in. Mm. Um, I found it was weird that when Al and Sam were talking in the hotel room about Bunny not being married to Reed... Oh, yeah. And uh, Sam was about to say, does that mean she's a bastard? But, I, and like, he was so offended by that. Like, right. And this is supposedly... In the future. 1999-ish. <laughs> so he should have been more evolved than to think that uh, people had to be married to have kids at the time, as a scientist anyway. Well, I think Sam is really religious, and I think that that's a religion kind of thing. I mean, nothing against religion. I just think that that's more of like a out of wedlock is kind of like a bad thing in religion. He seems to be so far in the series. But I just uh, found that weird. He was really hurt or offended by that. Like, oh no, she's a bastard child. Like, 
the bigger issue here is her dad is abusive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you want to take her away from the abusive parent. Yeah, the, the bigger issue here is... It's more more important. Or the fact that you're kidnapping, but, you know, be upset about the marriage thing. As people got married, had kids, and got divorced back then, too. So what would be the point of skipping that step? I like that Sam is trusting his own instincts in this episode instead of going by just what Al and Ziggy say. I think Al, because of his history with Velvet, that he has like a biased opinion against Bunny. So he was trying to influence what they were there for. Definitely. Because he just saw her and was like, she's a liar, she's a liar, she's a liar. And Sam's like, yeah, but that doesn't make any sense. Which is true because why would Sam have gone back just to reduce their prison sentence? I feel so mediocre. I feel like Buster wasn't a bad looking dude. Like he had muscles and he wasn't bad looking. He wasn't like an ogre. It was kind of weird. He had a gold tooth. That's kind of hillbilly of him. But it's Texas. So like I, I it just Sam looked in the mirror and was like, no wonder why you're crying. And I was like, it's not that bad. I mean, he wasn't like missing teeth. And you know what I mean? It wasn't it wasn't as bad as what Sam had said. The tattoo. The tattoo is horrific. Yeah, not a good idea. It didn't even look like a real tattoo, but... I think the whole situation in this episode could have been avoided if Bunny just went to New Mexico and found the mother and then they called the police. She doesn't know how to subtract 10 from 20. Good point. So that might be the reason in the script why she didn't just do the logical thing. Yeah, she doesn't, she's not very intelligent. She just, she's got a good heart, though. She's got a great heart, though. So you were confused about the letters thing. I was. I was. My thought was that if Bunny read these letters that somehow they got to read so Margaret would know where Reed was. But she said a package from Reed's brother. So my assumption is that Margaret was sending letters to Reed's brother's house trying to reach Reed. And then... The mail got forwarded or the well, package the, the, was sent. By right. The brother. the brother said, here's all your letters from your ex-wife, dude. Because Reed's brother knew where Reed was. Right. Hmm. OK, that that solved that for me because I was like, there's a lot of ways to just avoid this whole kidnapping situation. Kidnapping should be like the last option, you would think. <laughs> Can we talk about kidnapping? Probably not a good idea ever, unless you're, of course, saving someone from being hurt or killed, I guess. Right. She was rescuing Christy. Yeah, so that was a good thing. And that's probably why the mom got sole custody anyway, because... Reed seemed to be a jerk. Just a little bit. The crazy part about it is we really didn't get to know him, so we didn't even know that he was a jerk until we found out he was abusive. Which Bunny could have been lying about, but I don't think so. No. But Reed could have avoided going to jail by not calling the cops and not following Bunny, because Reed knew Bunny was taking Christy to her mother, Margaret. But he's a lawyer. He had the law on his side. Until they found out who he was. Right. And he didn't really, I don't, did he want Christy? Because he was firing a gun in the general direction of his baby. I think when it comes to stuff like that, it's more of a point. Like, no, this is my dish. Mm -hmm. This is my wagon wheel coffee table. I'm keeping it. Mm -hmm. Because he didn't even take care of her. He had a nanny to take care of her. Yeah. He he just could have avoided going to jail. He just didn't want his wife to have... The child. He didn't want Chrissy. He just wanted Margaret to not have Chrissy to hurt her. I could be wrong, but I feel like that's probably the point. I would say never fire a gun. Okay, period. But then again, never fire a gun towards a baby. Well, even the cop said you're shooting at your baby. That is definitely the uh, this guy is an a-hole moment in the episode. Yeah, and you can tell he was obviously a horrible father. If you had any sympathy for him at all in the episode thus far, when it got to that point, that's where you... Turn it off. I don't even like reading about anything with babies and guns. So the father aiming a gun at his child is... (laughs) The sheriff was like, dude. (laughs) Hello. He didn't say dude, but he meant dude. Well, I think at that point, the cops kind of realized that he was wrong. When they drove by the sign in the episode where it said $50 prize for amateur night at a strip club and Bunny was a stripper, did you know that that's what was going to happen in the episode? Did you see the foreshadowing? Kind of, yeah. I like, though, that they showed it ahead of time and then had her have like a flashback moment. That was cool. I think that was like an editing decision, it seemed to me. And it was the same editor who did only two episodes of Quantum Leap. It was this and Goodnight, Dear Heart, which also had weird flashes of stuff in it. His name is Alex Smite. He does a lot of the CSI stuff now. 
when I saw that, I said, that's out of character for uh, Quantum Leap to like show you what she's thinking. You don't usually see it. Yeah, I like. I really liked that they did that. Though. You did like that? I thought yeah. astute viewers would like see that sign, read it, put it in the back of your mind, and then you wouldn't need to see it again. But it was like her brain was clicking and you saw that. I don't know. I liked it because it was like a zoomed in. Like she was like, oh, yeah. It's definitely an artistic decision. So I'm assuming you didn't like that. I didn't think it was necessary. I don't think the vet scene was necessary. but <laughs> I don't think the bull sperm was necessary. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I think it was funny that Al missed her stripping. He was really mad and Sam was just like, that sucks for you. So can we say now we can establish a fact that Al's timeline goes along with Sam's timeline so he can't like just rewind it a few minutes? Yeah, I guess not. And what does it mean when Al said Ziggy reversed his field? I have no idea. Changed his mind? Maybe. So Ziggy was male in this episode. Good to know. I noticed a bunch of uh, little mistakes, let's say, in this episode. Uh, what were some of your favorites? The fact that in the toy store, Sam is holding a basket with a baby doll in it. And it doesn't even look like a baby. It's not like one of those anatomically correct, real looking babies. Like you wonder how they got the mold for that baby kind of baby doll. Yeah, it's definitely like a precious moments, big eyed, smooth face baby doll. Really weird, which is odd because the real baby was in 95% of the shots. Like sometimes they were literally holding a blanket, but the fact that they used a doll there was so odd. And you saw the doll's face. Yeah. And it had big like anime eyes. Yeah, it's weird. It was kind of crazy. And these uh, shows, when babies are on them, they usually use twins or triplets and they're only allowed to work for very short periods of time. That's why there's two or three of them so they can keep switching them out. But they just might not have been available or cooperating at the time, maybe. That was the biggest mistake for me. I didn't see it. When you pointed it out, I was surprised. If you go back and watch it, you'll never be able to unsee it. Yeah, no. I saw some weird things. Uh, probably my biggest thing that I saw was uh, they did a really great special effect at the end of the episode where Al is standing in the same spot as the car. He's in the hood area. And it looked really good until the two cops got out on either side of Al. And Al's closer to the camera and the cops are further back. And the cops are way bigger than Al. So Al is much smaller than he should have been. But he's a hologram. So right. it's not that big of a deal. It's not. And you don't notice it unless you do. But He's definitely in a specific spot in the three-dimensional space because he's in the center of the car hood. So he should have been a little bit bigger. So I think the scale was off. I also noticed the diaper, but we talked about that already. In that same scene, Julie Brown was wearing kind of like the stick-on bra tape, you know, that you wear with a certain kind of dress that you can't have a bra. Mm -hmm. And uh, what when she got out of the shower... Probably because it's not her baby and she didn't want to, like, have a baby pressed up against her naked self. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, it might be weird. Yeah, I just thought it was because she didn't want Scott Bakula to see her boobs. Or the entire room full of people. But she was also holding someone else's kid up yeah, to that's her. That's a good point. So. Things you wouldn't see normally back then. The ladder in the beginning of the episode was chained onto the roof. I feel like that's just welcoming someone to steal your baby. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think in the episode the ladder was supposed to be <laughs> chained to the roof by the baby's window. I think they were meant to have brought the ladder with them or found it and set it up there. Oh, okay. Maybe they just had extra time to chain it first. Drill a hole through the roof and uh, chain it to the ladder and yeah. Definitely made it more secure. I still think it was funny you stuck the baby in the bed of the truck. I laugh every time because you know it's a baby. <laughs> the episode's called Maybe Baby. So you're just thinking, okay, there's probably a baby in the basket. Even though there's it's not like, a baby in the basket. This is a, why are we stealing the laundry? <laughs> At least he didn't drop it. No, like, here you go, catch. <laughs> no! I'm going to throw it down to you. Slow motion. And then you see him leaping and leaping back two minutes. Yeah. Now, we disagreed on whether this was a mistake or just a timing thing. But when Sam is reading the map while he's driving, the insert shots don't match what his hands are doing when you see the shot of them driving with his hands on the wheel. Cause I disagree, yes. To me, he's got four hands. Because one holding the map, one pointing at where they're going on the map, and two on the steering wheel. To me, he is holding with his left hand, low on his lap, the map over the wheel. Like he has his four fingers underneath the wheel, and he has his thumb with the map over the wheel, holding the map. And driving with one hand while he points to the wheel. And then he puts his hand on the wheel for the next shot. That's what I see. You, on the other hand, think he's still pointing and has his hand on the wheel at the mm -hmm. same time. 
And uh, the other map continuity thing that I noticed that's probably nitpicky, but all this is anyway. <laughs> what else would we talk about if we didn't nitpick the show? <laughs> was when um, Bunny handed Buster the map, she was opening it up for him. And then when he had it, it was closed. So it was like the insert shots were filmed by a second unit that hadn't seen the film of the first unit. And maybe the continuity person wasn't there. But Clayton was really close to the border. So they did get that right. Yeah, we did double check on that and they got it perfect. So go 1990s Google. <laughs> I think it was Lugal back then. <laughs> The Snoopy Speedway that was behind Al and Sam while they were talking in the toy store came out in 1974, which was an old toy at the time. I don't know if they still made it, but in 1990, it was an old toy, but it still wasn't old enough for the episode. And we discussed the Barbie because it looks like it's the first edition of Barbie, which was in 1959. I know my Barbies. We're not sure if it was right to have the first Barbie still four years later in the episode because it looked like the first... Barbie, but her hair was kind of different. In 1963, they had more outfits on the original Barbie, but it could have still been the first Barbie. Yeah, only a few years old, and who knows how long it takes for the stock to rotate and how long they made that first edition of Barbie. What does pokey mean, anyway? Sluggish or slow or without energy. Hmm. Like, just feeling pokey. Sam didn't know what that meant, and I didn't either. I knew it was a character on Gumby. <laughs> Gumby and pokey. My favorite laugh out loud moment of the episode, and every time I watched it, was when Sam asked Big Bob, the deputy, where's the car? And he says, out back. Oh. Yeah, he wasn't good at his job. <laughs> he really wasn't. But he had a good heart. <laughs> There's a lot of funny moments. I thought it was funny when the kid didn't want to sell his car, but for $10 more, he said sold. 200 bucks, no. 210 Okay, fine. Sold. No, like 300 kid. You got to... Wait until he probably would have given you more. He had a price in his head and it was 210 or it was 205. And then when Sam said 210, he's like, oh, I got to take it. Was that a lot for a car back then? Mm -hmm. I want to buy a car for 200 bucks. Didn't seem like a nice car, though. Seemed like a fixer upper. But again, uh, Bunny proving that she's not very smart. They're trying to hide from the cops that are street over. And she tells Sam to peel out. Why would you do that? I feel like that would draw more attention to you. Right? Like, hey, there's a car peeling out over there. I wonder if it's the people that we're chasing. But she also can't add. And she's not the smartest. So. But she has a good heart. She has a good heart. Remember in the last episode I was talking about cartoon character names coming from Quantum Leap? Mm-hmm. Buster Bunny. Oh. Is that a coincidence? It was. Overall, I think Bunny and Buster did the right thing. By saving the baby from growing up in a beautiful household and reuniting her with her mother. Whether or not Margaret was a good mother, we will never know. I feel like she was probably better than Reed. Yeah, I don't think Margaret would fire a gun in the baby's direction. No, probably not. Overall thoughts on Maybe Baby? I think it was good. It was definitely more carefree, I think, than huge social issues. But that's a good thing. It was fun, and it will give us an opportunity to talk about car seat safety later on in the episode. Just a fun romp, you know, and uh, some funny characters and some funny situations. A fun romp. I Who wish says there, that? <laughs> I wish there was a little less gun and baby in the same frame of the show, but, you know, we're talking 25 years ago. As promised earlier, we have a great interview with Sean O'Banion, movie producer, and someone who might have gotten a start in the business by sneaking onto the Universal set and blending into the crew of Quantum Leap. Sean O'Banion began his career as a production assistant on Sequest DSV after sneaking onto the Universal Studios lot at age 17. After several more years as a PA on feature films, he eventually began to seek a position as a personal assistant. The career change proved a wise step, and he soon found himself working for and with some of the industry's most well-known and well-respected talent, both in front of and behind the camera, including Academy Award winner Christopher Walken, Jack Black, Ben Stiller, and acclaimed directors Joe Wright, Judd Apatow, and Academy Award nominee Peter Hedges. After years of watching and learning, O'Banion moved into producing in 2007 with Dakota Sky. The film became a cult hit and remained in the top 100 on Netflix for the next five years. In 2010, he produced Girlfriend, for which he received an IFP Gotham Award. He joined the Producers Guild in 2011 and produced The Automatic Hate in 2013. The film will be released in 2015, 
Currently, he is in development on several films, including one with partner Shannon Mullen and Academy Award winner Bruce Cohen. Mr. O'Banion, thank you for joining us on the Quantum Leap podcast. I understand you have an interesting story about one of your first experiences on a filming set, and it was Quantum Leap. Yeah, thanks for having me, by the way. I snuck into Universal, believe it or not, when I was 11 years old. Uh, It was the first time I did it. Uh, because I had read an article about how Spielberg had done it. Of course, he did it when he was 19 or something, but I figured, oh, I'm 11 years old, I could do it. And I actually did. I walked right past security, and nobody questioned me at all. And I knew at that time that Quantum Leap was being shot at Universal. I wasn't sure where, but I basically wandered the lot for a few days and, and figured out that they were on a stage near the front lot, And I can't remember, it was maybe like stage four or eight. It was one of the smaller stages at the front and then just sort of wandered into the soundstage and and very quickly uh, realized that they were doing an episode on a train, which of course was later revealed to me. It was called Honeymoon Express. And uh, I got to spend uh, at least three or four days just hanging around watching them shoot Honeymoon Express, which was to me pretty stunning because I'd never... You know, I, as a kid, 11 years old, you sort of always just think, well, if they're on a train, then they just go film on a real train somewhere. But this was a train inside the soundstage and I had green screen out the windows. And, you know, I got to watch the whole process. And then uh, at a certain point, I guess I was I, I was noticed by Scott and Dean Stockwell. And I remember a specific day, uh, maybe one of my last days on that episode, where the company broke for lunch, and the guy said, what are you doing, kid? And I said, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they said, well, you want to you sit here and have lunch with us? And I said, sure. And uh, Scott walked over and grabbed a couple apple boxes from a cart nearby, and they had sandwiches. And, and uh, Dean, I think, offered me half a sandwich. And we sat there on apple boxes in the center of the soundstage, and just the three of us <laughs> had lunch. Uh, and I think I revealed to them, if I remember correctly, they said, hey, who do you know here? How'd you get in here? And I said, nobody. I snuck in. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I think they both really got a kick out of that. So, you know, Dean asked me, I think, what I wanted to do. And I said, I want to make films. And, uh, you know, he, of course, told me that he'd been making films since he was younger than I was. And Scott was really great, said that he didn't know initially that he wanted to be an actor. He had started out doing something else. And I think his father was a lawyer and uh, he was maybe going to go into law, uh, but somehow realized that that wasn't it for him uh, and became an actor. And I actually was already a fan of his prior to Quantum Leap because he had done a Disney movie. I don't know if you remember, but he did a Disney like movie that we called I Man. The I stood for indestructible. And it was kind of like, uh, it was like a, movie where he was on the run from everybody but he couldn't be blown up or anything so i kind of knew who he was from that disney movie and they were just really great with me really great so then after that episode i think i i could only come back one day for the next episode which was disco inferno but i came back one day and got to see one of the stunt people do a high fall through like this slatted roof thing uh, which was really cool as a kid to see that and then the next episode that i spent the, the most time on i think i spent maybe seven or eight days on the set was uh, Machiko McKenzie, which was all about sort of post-war racism uh, in which uh, Sam is, comes back uh, married to a Japanese woman. And so I think yeah, I even went on location with them. I don't remember how I did it. I think I just wow. got in bands when they were, <laughs> they were leaving the lot. I would go to this little farmhouse. But yeah, I spent, uh, I spent a good amount of time on the show. And it was a huge, huge deal for me. It was the very first time that I had been exposed to actual production and seeing how the shots are set up and, you know, how the rehearsals are done and all that kind of stuff. So, and then of course, at the time it was my absolute favorite show. So it was about as big a thrill as you could give an 11 year old kid. Was there a constant fear of getting caught? No, you know, I think, um, and I've sort of, I teach filmmaking now too. And, The way that I got into the business by sneaking in when I was just about 18 or maybe I just turned 18, I just celebrated my 21st year in the the industry. And I think when you're that age, 11 through like 17, you know, you don't really think about consequence so much. Mm -hmm. I did eventually get caught when I was 11 or 12, I think, because I was walking around the, the exterior facade, you know, like Back to the Future and, and all that. Wow. Uh, the, the, out, the outdoor 
portion of the lot and nobody goes back there unless they're in a golf cart or you know they're in a car you know you don't you kind of don't it's 420 acres the whole lot so you don't really just kind of end up back there you know uh and i and i did eventually get caught because i was walking back there i walked through the western sets and i walked through the new york sets and then i found myself in hill valley and a guy in a golf cart stopped me and said, what are you doing? Who are you with? You know, what are you doing back here? And I said, I'm just, I'm with myself. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was like, no, 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 no. Get get in the golf cart. And, he, and I got in the car and then he took me up to the security office and they told me that I was trespassing and that I was, you know, breaking the law and my parents could be held liable. And they took a Polaroid of me and stuck it up on the wall. And, oh, uh, and I think, I think it was more for show than any, I think they were trying to scare me, but, but yeah, to answer your question, uh, I just, it never occurred to me that what I was doing was something that I could get in trouble for, you know? And once I was on the sound stage, I think everybody assumes that you're somebody's kid or you're somebody's nephew or whatever. And nobody really asks. It's really funny. I mean, you know, granted this was pre nine 11 and even before, um, I don't know if you remember, uh, in the late eighties, there was a security guard, a disgruntled security guard who had been fired and put on his guard uniform and went back into the lot and basically set the back lot on fire. Yeah. Uh, and arson, um, and a huge portion of it burned. And so obviously after that security got a lot tighter, but I was still able to get my way in there and by some wet unscrupulous means, I mean, you certainly couldn't do it today. But it, but it was easier then, and I just think as a kid, I just thought, you know, what <laughs> what's the worst that can happen, or, or maybe even more so, just I didn't care, you know. It was like I got to get in there, I got to see them do this stuff, and so I did. And then, sort of, you know, at least the reason I got to hang out on Quantum Leap for the next couple of episodes was because Scott and Dean knew me at that point. And used to come over in between scenes and just talk to me and say, oh, what you doing today? You know, I mean, they, they knew the secret, wow. <laughs> which is that I didn't belong and they thought it was cool. So uh, these guys are really as cool as everybody says they are. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm jealous. I have friends that are working on uh, NCIS New Orleans right now, literally in New Orleans. And they're working with Scott and I'm like, wow, he's such a cool guy. Mm. And Dean is great too. I, you know, I actually not seen either of them in person since I was 11 years old. But my friends over there in Louisiana tell me that Scott is just as nice now as he was then. That's awesome. And uh, you actually ended up getting in the business when you were what 18? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, in um, in August, 21 years ago, I got my first job by sneaking in again and hanging out on uh, Sequest, which was a for me, also a big deal. I, I wasn't a huge fan of the show. It was pretty new when I got on. But what I was a fan of was that Spielberg was a producer on it and Hamblin was a producer on it. And that was sort of the pinnacle for me that my first ever job would be that. And so for about the last two decades, I've been working on film and television. And for the last eight years, I've been uh, producing my own projects, two of which are on Hulu now. One is called Dakota Sky, which is sort of a teen coming of age story it's an r-rated movie though so people with young kids should be careful uh, a lot of language uh and the next one is called girlfriend which is about a young man with down syndrome who romances a girl that he went to high school with uh, a girl who does not have down syndrome and we won the gotham award for that one in new york so pretty pretty cool both those films look pretty good. Uh, Girlfriend really piqued my interest because uh, maybe it's because uh, the episode Jimmy and uh, the other episode that Jimmy was in, but I've always had uh, like a place in my heart for kids with Down syndrome. Yeah, it's a, it's a really complicated, challenging uh, film. You know, it's definitely indie drama, but our lead actor, uh, Evan Snyder, is just extraordinary. He is an extraordinary person. I think he was 31 when we shot. He's now... 35 or 36 maybe and i still talked to him i talked to him on the phone the other day he's really really talented and we were hoping that a movie would sort of get him uh greater opportunities as an actor but so far he hasn't done anything outside of theater after our film but uh, if anyone's looking for a really stellar actor who has down syndrome you could do far worse <laughs> and uh dakota sky is about a girl with a superpower of sorts 
Yeah, uh, Dakota Sky is about a girl who's about to enter her final year of high school, and she has a power that whenever someone lies, she hears the truth. And we sort of let the audience in on that because whenever someone lies in the movie, we put up a subtitle that actually says what they really mean or what the <laughs> truth is. Um, so it's, it's pretty funny, and it's also dramatic. She's facing all the things that young girls face at that age and in high school, and the only difference is that there are no secrets for her, you know, um, which makes her fairly angry and apathetic. Uh, but then she meets a boy who may have the ability to never lie, and it sort of changes her life. And actually, the screenwriter of that is working on a novel that leads up to... Actually, no, I think he's just doing a novelization of our film. But there's a little audio thing that we've put together that will tell you the story that happens right before the movie starts. So it's pretty cool. It sounds cool. And uh, you're working on a new one that's coming out soon? I've produced a film called The Automatic Hate, which hopefully will be coming out later this year. It stars Joseph Cross, who was in Milk and Lincoln. It has Adelaide Clemens, who's on television now, and Rectify, things on the Sundance Channel. And then we have Deborah Ann Wall from True Blood. We have Richard Schiff from The West Wing and Ricky Jay, who works a lot with Paul Thomas Anderson and David Mamet. And it's a very, very uh, dark, really impressive screenplay by a guy named Justin Lerner, who actually wrote and directed Girlfriend. So it was continuing on with that same filmmaker. Um, and then I'm working on a number of other projects. But nothing in the sci-fi genre, at least not yet. Mm -hmm. Trying to get to my own version of Quantum Leap. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah. <laughs> For a lot of your career, you were an assistant, production assistant, different kinds of assistants. What are some uh, cool things that stand out in your career? You worked on a lot of major films that everybody has seen. What is that like? I think... For me, a lot of it is it, it's tough to sort of say because for me, at a, at a certain point, it became just about a job. Although I will say that, you know, working on, say, something like um, the Matrix films was a pretty big deal. I mean, we were working on the sequel, so we knew the first movie. And my friend and I worked on that in San Francisco, and we just sort of, you know, we knew. We were like, this is cool. Like, everybody wants to be on this movie, and we're on the movie we got the job and we were seeing some pretty extraordinary things. I mean, the, the freeway chase, a lot of people don't even realize that that's all practical stuff. I mean, we built a, not we, but the art department built a three and a half mile freeway set on an abandoned airfield in Alameda, California. And they had something like 50 stuntmen and we spent six weeks uh, just destroying cars and driving trucks and motorcycles through everything. <laughs> it was just they did some things in that movie that were mind blowing. And then, you know, I, I've just, I've worked with a lot of great people. I started, one of my first assisting jobs was Courtney Cox and uh, David Arquette. And they were just two really, really excellent, nice people. And, you know, I've, I've had my share of not so nice people, but <laughs> Courtney and David uh, were really just wonderful to work for and with. And they really took care of me um, and just, that was on Ready to Rumble? The first movie I did with them, I don't remember what order it is, Screen 3, and then they did a movie that they actually produced that was called The Shrink is In, which I don't even know if it ever got any release here. But it was a funny movie, and Courtney and Dave were the producers, so started there and then moved on to, I think, maybe then we went to Screen 3. I think that's what happened. And then I went with David to Ready to Rumble. Was that fun? Also cool. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of weird Yeah, I mean, I, crazy I stuff. was not much of a wrestling guy, but, you know, it, it was cool to see how it all happened, for sure. And we had uh, all the real guys. We had Sting and Diamond Dallas and all these kind of guys. And Scotty Kahn, who, of course, went on to Entourage and, and now uh, the wife, Ivo. So, yeah, some just some cool people. I worked for Ben Stiller for about a year. had a really good experience doing that. I had Starsky and Hutch and... Along came Polly and... Duplex? Yeah, I did reshoots on Duplex, the end of Duplex. Is that kind of how that happens? You kind of get with one actor and stick with them for a while, or is it just worked out that way? I think if you have a good rapport with somebody, particularly in that position, they're looking for people that they can trust and people that sort of understand the way they work and the level of you know discretion because you're hearing things that shouldn't go out publicly and whatnot. Um, so I think... You know, yeah, if somebody if somebody really trusts you and feels comfortable with you, you know, generally you can stay in that position for a long time if you want to. 
of course, my goals were about trying to get to a place where I was making films as opposed to running around and making sure that they had the right coffee while they were making films. <laughs> um, so eventually I had to, I had to move along or, you know, if you're stiller, it was all about Snapple and a certain type of water, but, um, <laughs> mm -hmm. but, uh, it was all really great experience. It was all very good experience. Was it like a evolving process where you still working as assistant while you're trying to become a producer? Did one day you just say, this is it, I'm going to start doing my own thing? No, it was definitely an evolving process. Being an independent film producer is not the best or fastest way to make money. So inevitably, even after my first film, I think right before my first movie I produced, I was working for Judd Apatow. And then I went to do that movie. And I had been offered a position to stay on with Judd and his family and basically said, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity, but I, I got to go off and do this. Uh, so I went, but when I came back, you know, at a certain point, you end up spending more money while you're there, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, trying to make these little movies. So eventually I go back and call some people up and say, hey, if anybody's looking for help, uh, I'm available kind of a thing. So you go back and forth. I'm working on some larger projects now that I think in the distance I can see hopefully a slight change in terms of income and, and level of success in terms of when you do these smaller movies. You're not always guaranteed theatrical release. You're not even guaranteed really that you'll make any money sort of on the back end of things. So they're all little lottery tickets is what I call them. Each one is sort of a little opportunity that, you know, it could be a huge thing or it could end up just sort of going to VOD and not being seen by as many people. I mean, Girlfriend, we got a theatrical release. We played New York, uh, L.A., Boston, I think Chicago, maybe. But, you know, they're all experiences that, that teach you different things, not only about the process, but about how release works and how you get a film marketed to people and how you get people's eyes on even a festival. So. It all has value for sure. And frankly, going back to Quantum Leap, you know, and looking at the way that those guys treated me as a kid has a huge effect on the way that I interact with crew that I hire or the way that I expect actors on our projects to interact with people, particularly the indie level, because you just have to, everybody has to be playing the same game. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like you have to be a team. It all goes all the way back. <laughs> it goes all the way back to Quantum Leap, my first experience. Being a movie producer, when people find out, do they pitch you their idea for a movie? I would say it's 50-50. In L.A., people are accustomed to just meeting film people all the time. So it doesn't happen so much. It happens a lot when you go on location. All of my films so far have been done on location. The first one was in Arizona. The girlfriend was in the Boston area, and the last one was upstate New York. And so there are always people going, oh, yeah, I got an idea. I got an idea for a movie. But more frequently these days with the ease of contacting people is people email me through my company website and uh, and say, hey, what about this? Somebody sent me a documentary the other day and said, hey, what about this idea? And I sort of have to say, well, can't really accept unsolicited material at concert agencies or whatever. But it is something that happens you know, about half the time when you meet people. If they're not in the film business, they definitely want to try and pitch their idea. If they are, they sort of know that that's not the way it's done. But then, you know, at the same time, I'm I'm also, you know, I call myself sort of a, a, a junior producer right now. You know, I have a couple small credits, nothing quite far over a million dollars at this point. So I'm not exactly a target for people to try and get stuff done. Since your Quantum Leap experience as a child, are you more likely to, if you see a kid hanging out on the set, not notice him, let him slide? I would definitely notice them. But, I, I mean, I can give you an example. Years ago, I was working on a FX TV movie, and the drivers on the show knew how I had gotten into business and my story, you know, and sort of gotten around, partly because I like to tell it because it's fun. Um, but... uh there were these two guys, I think they were at like, you know, New York Film Academy, LA or something. And they were, they saw all the trucks and they pulled over and they started talking to the drivers and the drivers called me on the walkie talkie and said, Hey, Sean, why don't you come over? So I walked over and they were like, Hey, these two guys want to know how you get in and how it all works. And, and so I sort of basically took them and I was like, yeah, follow me guys. Are you hungry? Do you want to come to craft service? And 
took him in the set and let him look around. And, and it happened in a similar way with a guy who approached me on the streets. I was working on another TV show then, uh, watching Ellie, this, this thing with um, Julia Louis-Dreyfus. And um, this guy came up to me on the street and said, hey, I just moved from New York and I don't know anybody here. And I'm trying to get jobs. And, you know, if, if, if there's any way that I could do anything on this show or, you know, you recommend me to people in the future, I'd really appreciate it. And I sort of turned to him, I was standing with a friend of mine, and I turned to him, I said, you got your resume? He said, yeah, yeah, it's in the car, I have it in the car. I said, okay, go get it. And he ran to his car, and he got his resume, and he came back, and, you know, I looked it over. He had actually, it wasn't going to be his first job. He had worked for Robert De Niro in New York. But I looked at the resume, and I said, all right, all right, don't worry about it. And he said, what do you mean? I said, don't worry about it, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of you. And he said, wait what does that mean? Like, don't promise me anything if you're not going to do it. Cause then I'll just be waiting for the phone. Or I said, no, no, I'm, I'm not like that. I'm serious. Uh, we'll, we'll take care of you. And we started getting him jobs. And uh, my friend and I got him a job on the 24, you know, like I think it was like second or third season or something by then and got him regularly working to the point that he didn't need our help anymore. He was working on his own. And then he had something happen in his life that, sort of made him realize that production wasn't what he wanted to do, but he wanted to work in post-production. And he had taught himself how to edit and got himself a job in a post company in Hollywood and was cutting promos and DVD special features and things like that. And then when my first movie came up and and became a reality, the director slash co-producer had put the money in and we were going to make it. I said, we need an editor. Um, and of course, in the industry, you you sort of collect people that are your friends and they all have these different skills and film people just tend to know a lot of other film people. So I said, we need an editor. And he said, yeah, but we don't know any editors. I said, yeah, I think I do. And so I called this guy up. His name was Jeff. And I put him together with the director and he ended up cutting Dakota Scott. And then I did the same thing on Girlfriend, put him with that director and he ended up cutting Girlfriend and uh, the last film as well. Same and writer director. So I said, you know, can you use Jeff again? Yes, we are. Okay. Good. So that guy who just came up to me on the street is pretty much, you know, he's, he's my editor. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So uh, to find out more about your films, people can go to ravenwoodfilms.com, right? Yeah, ravenwoodfilms.com. It's also at ravenwoodfilms on Twitter or at Sean underscore O'Banion without the apostrophe. Yeah. When you were on Sequest, did your last name similarity to somebody who created the show, did that help you get that job, or was that just a coincidence? No, it's just a coincidence. I I literally was on that set for three months, and for the whole entire three months, I asked people every day if there was anything I could do. And I didn't know about unions, and I didn't know about sort of the rules of being hired. So for three months, I would ask, hey, can I do that for you? And people say, no, nah, thanks, kids, we're good. But there was a night where they were going to do an exterior at the amphitheater, which actually doesn't even exist anymore. That's old. I am. They knocked it down for Harry Potter World. And they were putting the extras in a van. So I just got in the van uh, with the extras. And they drove <laughs> us all up the hill. And when we got to the top where they were setting up this exterior that was supposed to be a, an Earth Oceans World Conference. You know, they had about 100 extras and these sci-fi looking vehicles. I got out of the van and there was a guy yelling at another guy. And he was saying, I can't. You know, I don't have enough people here to put your trailers where you need them and get your makeup tables and stuff set up. So pick what you want done, and I'll do that first. And I just walked over and raised my hand and said, I'll do the makeup tables. Where they go? And they both sort of looked at me, and, and finally the, the guy who I realized was an assistant director said, okay, fine. Go with him. Pull the makeup tables off that truck over there. Put them in this room down here. Put all the light bulbs in. Plug them in. Get them ready. Set up the director's chairs for the cast to sit in and extras to sit in. Uh, and come back and find me. So I did that, came back to find him about 20 minutes later. I said, okay, that's done. And he said, uh, okay, here's a walkie-talkie and a headset. He said, you ever use it before? I said, no, sir. He said, all right, don't talk on it, just listen. If I tell you, lock it up, that means nobody walks through. When we cut, you can release people. Just stay here and do that, I'll come find you later. I said, okay, put the headset on. I called my dad. I said, dad, I think I just got a job. <laughs> And uh, I worked that I worked that whole night. Uh, it was a night shoot, so I worked all the way until basically sunrise. And he said, uh, the AD said to me at the end, he gave me an extra voucher that probably paid me the first night, which I still have, which is cool. My little receipt. And uh, and he said, I don't know how you get in the lot every day or who you know, but uh, <laughs> if you're here tomorrow at uh, at 9 a.m., I'll hire you. And I said, great. 
so I, you know, got everything together and showed up and I worked the rest of the, the first season that way. That's awesome. Yeah. Hopefully your story inspires a whole bunch of future filmmakers to sneak into places. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't <laughs> recommend, you know, to clear myself legally. Right. I wouldn't recommend it these days. But like I said, it's a different world that we live in. Uh, and security is taken much more seriously. But, you know, I mean, even back then, like I said, when I was a kid, 11 years old, they took my picture and, you know, said I was trespassing. So it was a big deal. Uh, when I was 17, there used to be a sit-down commissary in the Universal lot. They don't have it now. It's more like a buffet kind of line that you just go through. Uh, but there used to be a, a place where you can actually make a reservation and have a lunch. So I decided that maybe if I called from off the lot and made myself a reservation, that my name would come up in the system. So for a while, that's how I started getting in. Once I'd go to the guard gate and say, I have a lunch meeting, and they'd look in the computer and there'd be my name, you know, 12 o'clock commissary. So they'd give me a pass that's supposed to be just for me to go there and then leave. But of course, I wouldn't leave. I'd go <laughs> have my quick lunch. I'd always have the lunch there. Uh, and then go walk around. <laughs> so um, I think there are ways to do it. And my feeling is if, if nobody's getting hurt, there's nothing wrong with it. Obviously, you know, I don't recommend that anyone break any laws. But yeah, that's, if I hadn't done it, I, I don't know that I'd be in the industry. Today. I don't know what I'd be doing. The only thing I ever wanted to do would be in the industry. I think more than sneaking in, it's a good example of the difference between wanting to do something and taking that first step to do something. Yeah, for sure. Going back to your time on the Quantum Leap set, one of the first sets you saw on Quantum Leap was the train set. Was that like half a train? And what was around it? And what did the whole uh, soundstage look like? When, when you walked in, it was very, very dark. I mean, because they were shooting. So the only lights that are on are the, are the lights that are pointed into the set. They had a full train car, an actual train car in there. I don't remember if it had the wheels on. I doubt it. I think they just had the shell of it in there. And then there was a, another piece that was like a half of a train car uh, that was in front of that one. So, you know, if they were shooting, you could walk from car to car. And obviously everybody was sort of clustered in there watching them shoot. And I did walk in to the train when they were, when they were, obviously you couldn't stand in there because it, it was an accurate train. It was a very thin hallway uh, and little rooms off the side. But I walked in because I wanted to see what was going on in there and where the camera was. And I met, her name was Alice Adair. She was the guest star for the episode. She was very sweet. And I remember the guy who played the villain actually scared me. <laughs> <laughs> he was In the episode, he's supposed to be her ex-husband and he's chasing them down and he keeps threatening to kill them. And, and I just remember him being, you know, I remember them filming the scene where he says, you're not afraid of me or something like that. And, and Sam Beckett says, no. And he says, you should be because I'm going to kill you or something like mm -hmm, that. And mm -hmm. I just thought... Oh God! And then, <laughs> and then uh, on another day, they were doing the scene where Al is sitting in front of the board, basically, that are determining if they're going to finance the project anymore. And I didn't realize, you know, I, I 11 years old, I wasn't thinking about that they still had probably 15 more episodes to shoot that season. So all I heard was a snippet of dialogue where they were saying, you know, Admiral Calavici, we believe we're not going to continue. The program, and I, and as a little kid, I was like, "Oh my God, are they canceling the show? <laughs> what are they going to do? What are they going to do? Maybe Gene's leaving the show. What's happening here?" Hmm. So, and then you realize, you know, when you're standing on the set, they give out sides, which are like shrunken versions of the day's shooting script, literally shrunken down, so you can you can fit it in your back pocket. And so you can get that, but that's all you get. So if you don't get a full script, and I I eventually swiped a pair of sides you can see what they're going to say, but you can't see really what the scene that comes after or the scene that comes before. So I remember thinking, oh man, maybe they're in trouble. <laughs> the show's going to get canceled. But no, it was, I mean, it was amazing to stand on that stage and see a train car. And obviously there's nothing out the window, but, and you're also, you're watching everything that the costumes were of the time period. I can't remember when that episode was set. I want to say like the fifties or something, late fifties. And then even the next episode to go into Disco Inferno and everybody's wearing butterfly collars and platform shoes and you just think the extras are all dressed up. I mean it's no matter what, even now like, I'm I make films and I still I, I find the project just full of magic. And that's even when I know what's coming and I'm part of the process that makes sure that the things that are required are there. It's still a magical thing to me that there's 150 people all sort of working towards this one goal, which is 
one twenty fourth of a second. And so to be in there and, and watch actors that, that I just was starstruck about and perform these scenes and stand there on a train set and know that within a couple of weeks, I was going to be sitting at home on my dad's couch on a Wednesday night and watch that episode and go, hey, I stood right there. <laughs> you know, I, I was around the corner for that. Did your parents know you were doing this? Oh, yeah. I mean, my dad did. My dad was a notorious rule breaker, so... <laughs> He was like, yeah, sounds cool. (laughs) (laughs) Did you stay a fan of Quantum Leap after your experience? Oh, yeah. I watched that show until they took it off. And I got to tell you, my personal favorite episode probably ever was MIA, which I'm told, unfortunately, I have not revisited on DVD because I'm told that they didn't want to pay the rights to uh, Georgia on my mind. And to me, it was such a huge part of that episode. So I haven't revisited the episode, but that episode was always my favorite. So when the show came to a close and they tied it back to that episode, that was for me like one of the greatest things ever. Yeah. That that episode just really resonated with me as a fan of the show. I would wholeheartedly agree with you on that. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend MA on Region 1 DVD, but if you can get a different region or I believe Netflix actually has a proper song now. Oh, do they? Do the Region 2 discs have the music the way it should be? Yes, Region 2. I have the Region 2 discs. I don't think I'm supposed to. Uh, Are we allowed to? I don't know, but I have. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? If they're on Amazon, we can buy them. Exactly. Yeah. That's where I got them. So. Uh, yeah, I'll have to look that up because that, that was a yeah, great was episode. Definitely. I've worked with Bruce McGill before a couple times, I think, uh, and who played the bartender mm-hmm. in, in those final episodes. And he's also a really fantastic guy and, and told me a lot of nice stories about his experience and even with Don Belisario and people on the show. So. But yeah, I mean, that experience, like I said, was a very formative thing for me to sort of see as a kid, to understand how it happens and understand that you really only shoot two or three pages a day on a television show. And you're just, you know, you're there for 12, 13, 14 hours a day and how the actors are able to keep an energy level up and match a scene. You know, you may shoot on Monday the scene where he comes into the train and walks into one of the rooms, but you don't shoot the room until Thursday for whatever reason. So he has to remember so that it's continuous, the performance is continuous. And just to learn stuff like that as a kid was pretty great and see how that happened. That was a really cool interview. I I wish I did cool stuff like that when I was a kid. But I, I I think my favorite part was that he got to like sit down and have lunch with Scott and Dean. And that was really neat. And they knew his secret and didn't tell anybody. That's pretty awesome. It really shows how cool they really are. That, that makes you feel good, you know. I wish I did stuff like that when I was a kid, but I just didn't have the gumption. Yeah. You also weren't located right outside of a studio. If I was, I might have. Might have been my thing. I think that's really awesome. Every little piece of the puzzle we get brings us that much closer to knowing what it was like to be there during the production of Quantum Leap. Definitely a cool guy. And now it's time for the original audio drama, Quantum Leap, The Impossible Dream, Need You Now, Part 2. And in this episode, we have a special guest star, Jennifer Runyon. You might know her as Peg Stratton from Genesis. Yay! So uh, thank you, Jennifer, for being a part of the show. That is so cool that she's participating in our audio drama. It's awesome. What an honor. And she was good. Of course she was good. She's still my favorite character on the show so far. So, Is the waiting suite ready? Dr. McKenzie is standing by. Neurological link is active. The imaging chamber is powered up. We are good to go. Well then, this is it. Let's change history. Three, two... When you leap, the game is always to figure out who you are, where you are, and why you're here. I looked around and I could see I was in the living room of a house. The TV was on, but I didn't recognize the program. I was alone in the room and there were no mirrors that I could see, but I was holding a phone in my hand, so I tapped on the camera app and flipped to the front facing camera. Wow, I'm a teenage girl. And I have a text. 
Send the money by tomorrow, or your photos will be on the internet for all to see. Oh boy. What if you could leap into the past, still facing mirror images that were not your own, still driven by an unknown force to change history for the better, and still guided by a hologram that only you could see and feel. But now you are also able to leap home. We've solved the problem. We live the impossible dream. Shelly, what are you doing with my phone? I... Sorry, I picked it up by mistake. Give it here. Okay, but you just got a very disturbing text. Oh, so you're reading my text now? I said I'm sorry. I thought it was mine. What's this about pictures? Are you in trouble? It's none of your business. I want to help. Are you being blackmailed? Who by? I don't know who by. Oh, Shelly, I feel so stupid. What happened? It seemed okay at first. He was just a boy I met on Facebook. He called himself Marty, but I don't think that was his real name. <sighs> we became friends, I guess. He was always texting me. Every day, there'd be some new text. At, at first, they were nice, you know, Hi, Carmen, it's Marty, great to see you. And it was great. And then... Carmen, it's okay. You can talk to me. Right. Because my little sister is going to solve everything. That's what I'm here for, I guess. He talked me into sending some pictures. The sort of pictures you wouldn't want made public. And then everything changed. That's when things got nasty. He started demanding money. He said if I didn't pay, he'd publish the pictures. Well, I didn't pay. And then he put him on Flickr. It was a harmless one. But he still has the rest. The ones that are not so harmless. And now he's set a deadline. How are you supposed to pay him? Couldn't he be traced by the money trail? PayPal. I, I suppose he could be traced, but he's still got the picture, so I can't even report it. Oh, Shelly, what am I going to do? Show me how you contact him. Why? I might be able to help. You. Trust me on this. I just want to make sure I've understood this. Amber has leaped back to the year 2010. Yes. Into the life, but not the body, of one Shelly Cartwright. Yes. History records that Carmen Cartwright, Shelley's sister, took part in a series of minor robberies shortly after this leap date. She was eventually caught and went to jail. Ziggy says it's almost certain that that's when Amber needs a change. It's all very noble. But why should my company finance that? What's in it for Stockwell Industries? Peter, I can't make financial decisions for you. We change history for the better, but only in small ways. I know it looks like keeping one teenager out of jail is not very important, but that's not seeing the big picture. Think about what's happening here. In our waiting suite, right now, there's a girl from 10 years in the past, and if Dr. McKenzie gives the all clear, you might even get to talk to her. Ignoring Amber, ignoring the effect that we may or may not have on history for that alone, for the ability to interview actual people from the past, that's got to be worth saying. Ryan, we've got a fix on Amber, and an update on the mission. It's about cyberbullying. Cyberbullying? Ziggy says Carmen was being blackmailed by a cyberbully, and that's why she went down the road of crime. If we can stop the bullying, that would probably change things. I lost a niece to cyberbullying. What happened? She, uh, I don't really know. She was being abused online. She committed suicide. Back then, the authorities didn't take online abuse seriously. So nothing was ever done about it. I'm sorry to hear that. Ryan, the imaging chamber is fired up, and Ziggy has downloaded all the data to your handling app. We're ready. Go talk to your wife. I gotta go. Barbie will look after you until I get back. No problem. Good luck.
Hey, honey. Yes, I am alone. Thanks for noticing. Oh, right. I guess it could have been awkward to answer in company. And now that we've got that out of the way, hi, honey. Here's what we know. It's 2010. You're Shelly Cartwright, age 15. Shelly turns out all right, but her sister doesn't, so we think you're here to save the sister. That would be Carmen Cartwright, age 17. Ziggy says you're here to... Stop a blackmailer. I figured that out already. Right. But Ziggy doesn't know who the blackmailer is. Nor does Carmen, but I do know he calls himself Marty and how to contact him online. All right, show me. Barbie, watch this. Pay attention. Okay, here we go. That was Amber. She's doing great. Barbie, did you figure it out? I did. The perp is Gary McFarlane, age 56, an accountant for one of the local insurance firms. I can even tell you his home address. How? Oh. His account details were posted on Pastebin, along with millions of other account holders, when Bennett Sharp was hacked in 2017. Unlucky for them, lucky for us. Well, that's good. It gets better. He lives locally. Local to where Shelley and Carmen live. I mean, Amber could visit. Okay, I'll go tell her. Shelly, I've decided what I'm going to do. What would that be? I'm going to pay the money. Oh, Carmen. (sighs) Well, what else can I do? We found the blackmailer. His name is Gary McFarlane, and he lives in Dawson Road. That's just a half a dozen blocks from here. You have to get over there. How much time do I have? I have to pay by the end of the day. Or he's going to publish those pictures tomorrow. She probably should never have taken those pictures in the first place. Carmen, you did nothing wrong, except maybe trust someone who turned out to be a sleazeball. Thanks, sis. I know you mean well. But I have to do what I have to do. Do you have enough money? Yes. I'll be fine. She doesn't. Ziggy says this is probably where Carmen's life of crime starts. You have to stop this. I know. I have to go. I have to do what I have to do. Good luck. I'll scout ahead. Ziggy, send her me on Gary's house. This is the place. I can see Gary now. He's at his computer. Will do, Barbie. Sometime I forget I can walk right through his desk. Oh my word, he's cataloging more pictures, all of young girls less than half his age. But I don't see Carmen. Ugh, I don't want to look at this. I'm looking away. This isn't something I should see. Barbie. Lawrence would have a field day with this guy. He's a sleazeball, all right. In fact, he's worse than a sleazeball. He's got dozens of victims, maybe more. Oh, boy. Quantum Leap, The Impossible Dream was created and written by Jill Arroway, starring Tawny Finneran as Amber Lee and Juan Morrow as Ryan Lee. Special guest appearance by Jennifer Runyon as Carmen Cartwright, with Hayden McQueenie as Peter Taylor, and Suzanne Smiley as Barbie Sutton, Need You Now Part 2, was edited, cast, produced, and directed by Albert Mark Burge. Narration by Suzanne Smiley. Quantum Leap, The Impossible Dream is produced in association with the Quantum Leap Podcast and is a Barron Space production. And that is part two of Quantum Leap, The Impossible Dream. I hope you liked it. There's a couple more parts in this story. I'm actually a really big fan of our audio drama. And I have i don't think I've ever listened to audio dramas before. I listen to audiobooks, But this and the one The Signal had was the only audio dramas I listened to. So, And they're both by Jill. So, <laughs> She's amazing. Tawny's doing a great job. Everybody involved is really doing a great job. Even Heather is doing a great job. I looked around high and low for an artist for our cover art for this new project. And no one stepped up. (laughs) So I said, Heather, you have to draw. So it's not perfect, but actually, I'm actually kind of proud of the... I love it. I think it's really good. I drew it all out of nothing. I don't know. (laughs) I came up with it all, but it actually kind of turned out better than I thought it was going to. I am loving where this audio drama is going. Yeah, I really like it. I think it's cool that it adds an element to our show. I love Jill's writing, so um, I'm a big fan. Speaking of writing, we have a new member of our crew. 
Oh, yes. Welcome, Chris D. Philippus. That name might sound familiar to you because he is the author of the Quantum Leap novel, Foreknowledge. That's kind of awesome. It is kind of awesome. That's the one where we find out what it's like to a leapy after Sam leaps out. Which is what I'm always talking about. I'm looking forward to reading that one. Yeah. He also does a radio show. He writes other books. I just read last night one of his other books called The Seeker, a novella of truth. And truth is an acronym. It was a really good book. It's about a time traveler, an invisible man, and an ancient horror. It's a really exciting, good read. It's available on Amazon. And to find out more about the book and more about Christopher, go to theflipside.com. D-E-F-L-I-P-S-I-D-E.com. It's awesome that he's going to be part of our crew and he's going to be writing some segments. And this is his first segment. So here's Quantum Reboot by Chris D. Philippus. This segment has a spoiler level of Mirror Image. If you haven't seen the whole series, you might want to skip this one. Welcome, everyone. I'm Christopher DeFilippis, and I'm so happy to be a part of the Quantum Leap podcast. Because, like you, I get a thrill whenever I get to hear this. Theorizing that one could time travel within his own lifetime, Dr. Sam Beckett stepped into the Quantum Leap Accelerator and vanished. Vanished. That's a tempting word to describe the state of Quantum Leap these days, which has all but disappeared from the popular consciousness, except in the minds of diehard fans like us. But that's the problem with diehards. We never give up on anything. And Quantum Leap fandom is especially diehard because it is a diverse and multi-layered show that spawned a diverse and multi-layered fan base. Poll 10 Quantum Leap fans about what made the show great, and you'll get 10 wildly different opinions. But despite this, the same question seems to burn on the lips of all Leapers. Are there any plans for more Quantum Leap? How about a new TV show? Or even a big screen feature? And it's a logical question. What with the current mania for reboots, remakes, and reimaginings that have become the stock and trade of modern entertainment? But bringing Quantum Leap back in either film or television is a terrible idea. At least currently. And before you run me out of the Quantum Leap fan community with torches and pitchforks, hear me out there's a small matter we need to contend with called reality. First of all, NBC Universal owns the rights to Quantum Leap, and for it to go on in any way, they would have to get behind the project. I've experienced this firsthand because when I got paid for my Quantum Leap novel foreknowledge, it wasn't Berkeley Publishing that cut me the check, but NBC Universal. I even got notes from a Universal executive with concerns about some of the scenes in the book. So, despite NBC's seeming indifference to fans, the company is fully vested in the legacy and future of a potentially lucrative intellectual property, and won't lightly hand over the reins, not even to show creator Don Belisario. Belisario said as much a few years ago at the Leap Back 09 convention that was held in California to commemorate Quantum Leap's 20th anniversary. In a joint appearance with Scott Bakula, along with Dean Stockwell, who participated via telephone, Each said that Quantum Leap was the best job any of them ever had, and they'd love to do more. But then Scott offered this sobering remark. You know, look, years ago, Don may not remember this, but he had a big meeting at Universal and said, let's talk about Quantum Leap the movie. And they said, we've talked to our marketing people, and they've told us that we can't sell that name. So we're not going to make the movie. We can't sell it. So those are the kinds of things that you go up against. As a Quantum Leap fan, this isn't exactly the kind of thing you want to hear. And especially not from Sam Beckett himself. If he can't offer hope, who can? But one thing has changed since then to prove the stupidity of network marketers. There was a Quantum Leap movie, and it was successful. Only it was called Source Code. So maybe the time is right to revisit the idea of a Quantum Leap film franchise. But again, Scott chimed in with yet another reality check. The reality is, and this is just being totally honest, if we were fortunate enough, if Don was fortunate enough, to get the rights to go and make this movie, the odds of Dean and I being in it would be very, very small. You know, we might get some uh, cameo thing or something, which would be cool. If there could be a Quantum Leap movie franchise, it would be fantastic. In in any shape and form, as long as he's driving the boat. The he Scott is referring to is Belisario. But while Don might conceivably get an executive producer credit and final story approval for a movie, 
it still really wouldn't be Quantum Leap. Not without Scott Bakula and Dean Stockwell portraying Sam and Al. So, if a movie is a bittersweet proposition at best, then what about a new TV show? That would be even worse, though it seems to be the more likely option. As Belisario laid out at the convention, NBC still would like to do Quantum Leap for Sci-Fi Channel, and they don't want to screw around with a feature. And we don't want to do a movie for TV. I guess we can assume that statement is still accurate, since there have been no reports since to contradict it. But talk about ambiguous. Since NBC isn't keen on a theatrical feature, and Belisario doesn't want to do a TV movie, then a series is the only thing left. But the specter of a sci-fi channel series pretty much leaves Leap fans where we've been for decades now. For a while, the sci-fi channel was touting plans to produce a series called A Bold Leap Forward that would pick up where Quantum Leap left off featuring a female Leaper, Sam's daughter Sammy Jo, who would pick up Sam's mantle of putting right what once went wrong. But it never got beyond the initial announcements, and I'm glad to see any such idea remain withered on the vine. Here's why. The biggest obstacle to rebooting Quantum Leap these days can be summed up in two words. Battlestar Galactica. Ron Moore's reimagined version of Battlestar Galactica was so successful that it rewrote the playbook on how to retool an old TV series and make it resonate with modern audiences. Make it dark. Make it edgy. Make it morally ambiguous. In other words, make it Star Trek Deep Space Nine. But I digress. Actually, Battlestar just capitalized on a burgeoning television trend, the cult of the anti-hero. This paradigm shift started way back with the success of shows like Seinfeld and The Sopranos, which proved that characters didn't have to be especially noble or likable to be entertaining and watchable, or, more importantly, to get ratings. These shows broke the television mold so thoroughly that it is now almost impossible to find a compelling comedy or drama that doesn't feature unlikable, selfish, or even sociopathic main characters. Dexter, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Mad Men, Breaking Bad, Boardwalk Empire, Weeds, The Walking Dead, Television is becoming increasingly fixated on not very nice people doing not very nice things. Now, try to reconcile this with the notion of a modern Quantum Leap reboot. You'd be hard-pressed to come up with a concept more antithetical. Quantum Leap is fundamentally about a good guy helping ordinary people make their lives better in some small way. It's all selfless, noble intent, without a meth lab in sight. Any new Quantum Leap show would have to adhere to this darker, dysfunctional aesthetic to even have a hope of getting off the ground. So what, you say? We can handle it, so long as it means more leave. Oh yeah? Time for another reality check. Remember this little ditty? Leapers raged when this new theme song debuted. And if you couldn't tolerate something this inconsequential, what makes you think you'd embrace a darker, edgier leap? Just imagine the evil Leaper being a series regular, and Sam not helping people so much as being torn over whose future to screw up the least in any given episode. Because that's what it would be. You'd be wasting your faith on moronic, bandwagon network executives to expect anything different. And if this is the likely shape of new leaps to come, then what's the point? Let the programming pendulum swing back the other way before reviving Quantum Leap. Or, better yet, leave well enough alone. Like Sam Beckett, we Leapers will never get home again. So let's be content to celebrate our favorite show in podcasts like this and spread the quantum gospel to legions of potential fans who have yet to don their Fermi suits and step into the accelerator chamber. Any attempt to recreate the magic would be as lame and misguided as a souped-up new theme song, like trying to put right something that never went wrong. Wow. If that's any indication of how his articles are going to go in the future, I'm loving it. Yeah, I'm I'm glad to welcome him to our team, and I think he's going to fit in pretty well. I think so, too. He seems like a cool guy. We're here to roast the parents of buckling up. Two guys who have lost small limbs and a tree surgeon, Vince and Larry. (laughs) I love these guys. They remind me of my husband. Always broken in a dead-end job. (laughs) 
By getting people to buckle up, they have saved thousands of lives. On the job, what's the first thing that goes through their heads? <laughs> the steering wheel! <laughs> Vincent Larry, tell me, how do you want your coffee? Regular or decapitated? <laughs> Everybody give them a hand. You could learn a lot from a dummy. Buckle your safety belt. On the big highway of life, there's only one safe place for kids. Backseat, baby. The front seat's not the place to drop out. Don't want that big old bag to pop out. Backseat, baby. Put that booties in the backseat. Backseat, baby. Have that kiss you never meet. I'm here to remind you to put them behind you. So now is the much anticipated car seat safety section. <laughs> Hopefully nobody hates me after this section. <laughs> I don't know what has come over me that I'm so crazy about car seat safety, but I've always been a seatbelt kind of person too. I know we've talked about this on the show, but I've always been a stickler for seatbelts. And I have lots of friends who don't wear their seatbelt at all. And I won't let them ride in my car without one on. <laughs> A friend of mine didn't used to wear one, and his excuse was always, uh, if it's my time, it's my time. I said, no, that's not how it works. If you're not wearing a seatbelt, you go out the windshield. If you're wearing a seatbelt, you stay in the car. Also, you kill everyone else in the car because you become a projectile. Uh, basically, it's an object in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. So if you are in a car traveling forward and the car stops short, you're the object in motion. So is the car. But the car stops short, but you don't. So you keep going. Right. Unless acted upon by an outside force, which would be the seatbelt that's attached to the car that got stopped. Right. Or in the car seat. The thing that gets me, when Rennie was born, we had her in a car seat and I didn't look anything up. I just strapped her in. I don't know. They put her in. Actually, when she was born, we had to have her in a car bed. So she wasn't even in a car seat at first because she didn't pass the car seat test, which I found out now is because we had a car seat that doesn't fit newborns. So good to know. We even have two of them. They're actually not rated to fit newborns well. So that's probably why she didn't pass the car seat test. So when she finally went to a car seat, I didn't know where the straps were supposed to be. I just clicked the chest clip and I strapped her in, but I made sure it wasn't too tight because I didn't want to hurt her. She was two months old, I think, maybe six weeks. So, yeah, I had no idea what I was doing. I don't even know if it was in right, in the car right. I don't even remember. But I look back now at the pictures of her. Loose car seat straps. She could have been tossed out of the car. Honest mistakes we didn't know at the time. Seriously had no idea. Like, there was nobody. When they let us home from the hospital, I'm surprised that they, I, I know you were like, that. We, we just go home now? Like, there's nobody <laughs> to, like, make sure we're taking care of this precious new thing. And I know a lot of parents feel like that. Like, okay, now we're going to go home and we have no idea what we're doing. And a lot of pregnant women, me included, we read a lot of um, books on pregnancy and birth and labor and all that stuff. But we don't read anymore. Like, <laughs> we don't, we just... Don't go past that for whatever reason. Once you have the baby, you don't have time to read books on babies. So that should be a thing they teach you when you're pregnant. Read about the baby part because that's way longer than the nine months that you have the baby in your belly. Car seat safety is definitely one of the things you should research while you're pregnant. And I have gotten the reputation <laughs> of being kind of car seat crazy. One of my friends was actually afraid to come over because... She knew I would judge her by her car seat. <laughs> and that uh, sucks. But um, but I guess it's good in the fact that I'm just trying to keep everyone's kids safe. I'm I'm really not mean about it. I'm I'm nice and I I don't say anything to anyone except if they're, you know, my close friends and I'm to a point where I can mention something. And even if I do, I tread lightly and unless someone says can you help me learn about right. this? Then you're like, here's Actually, a ton of information. Exactly. And I and I know the right information. I think I've mentioned on here before, my daughter is rear facing. She is a tiny little two year old. She's tall and skinny. She's only 25 pounds. She's been 25 pounds for the last year, but she's growing taller. She just is too busy to eat most of the time. <laughs> so she's tall and skinny and she's, but she's growing great. The doctors say she's fine. She will probably be rear facing until she's four or more. However, until she's 40 pounds, she will be 
rear facing in her car seat. I bought her new car seat before I really knew anything. I knew that I wanted her to rear face longer. Now that I know more, I could have gotten a car seat that would have rear faced her longer. But her car seat's pretty good. She has a safety first Air 70. If for anybody who's like crazy obsessed with car seats like me. I just thought it was really cool because it had a cup holder and it. And it has like safety bars on the side, like in the material, like for race car drivers that it looked cool. <laughs> it, it looks like a NASCAR with a five point harness and, and totally it's ginormous. enclosed. And yeah. yeah, it looks like the safest one. That's something you don't want to skip out on on money. And another huge plus to her car seat, she has tons of leg room. She's tall and she has really long legs and they don't even touch the back of the seat. So that's another plus to our car seat, which I've seen a lot of car seats. If you are interested in car seat information, which you should be if you have a kid at all. So before you listen to me hammer on about car seats, if you really want to know, obviously you can fast forward if you really don't. But I really recommend you listen because a lot of the information that I learned, I had no idea. Like I said, if I look back at pictures of Rennie when she was first in the car, she was really unsafe. And I'm so glad I learned this information. We are in no means trying to do anything but educate. So also, if you want to learn more information, we will put links on our website. And there's a great Facebook group called Car Seats for the Littles. And you can join. It's a private group, so you have to be approved. But you can ask them to help you with any kind of car seat concern. And they're certified car seat technicians tons of them in there to help you and they can also help you find a local one that will come help you in person. I am not as much as I would love to be a certified car seat technician and that might be in my future at some point. I am not one. I am just passing on information to get your brain going to look up more information. So I'm just starting the conversation. With that being said, we will post information on our website. I know a lot of parents think that you can turn your child forward facing at a year, but that's actually not true. You should not turn your child forward facing until they are at least two. And a lot of the states, the laws are changing for that now. But it's not as much age or weight. It's more about bone maturity. And until a child is around four, a child's spine isn't strong enough to protect their spinal cord from that much of an impact. If you watch, they have tons of videos on YouTube, but you'll see if a car gets in a head-on collision, the harness holds the child back, but their arms, legs, and head go forward, and their neck isn't strong enough to withstand that much of a force. So it could cause internal decapitation, which those two words scare the crap out of me. (laughs) I know how horrible that sounds, but what is that exactly? The spinal cord could sever and you're child would would die right then and there in the car seat. And the upside of forward facing your kid too early is? I don't know. One. I do understand because my daughter cried for months in the car and a lot of people turn their child around so they can see them and they can see like their parents in the car and that stops them from crying. But the argument that the car seat group has on Facebook is your child crying in the back even though it's heartbreaking is better than if anything were to happen to them and they were to get hurt. There's a lot of kids, parents that have actually been injured by car seats being used improperly that speak out. And there's a website called joelsjourney.org. And it's about a little boy who was forward facing. He was 18 months old and forward facing. And so Joel is okay. But he was severely injured because he was forward facing at 18 months old and nobody knew any better. But he's now seven, going on eight, according to the website. But there's a website all about his journey and his parents and family are trying to make everybody aware that you shouldn't turn your kids around at one because it's dangerous. So at least two is the recommended rear facing. But Rennie is fine rear (laughs) rear facing and I prefer her rear facing until she grows out of her car seat. And that's a big thing, too. Know your height and weight restrictions on your car seats. Make sure you're adjusting the straps so that they're tight and they pass the pinch test, which is um, you shouldn't be able to pinch any of the strap at their shoulders, right above their shoulders. And also um, make sure the chest clip is even with their armpits. And also make sure your car seat is not expired because 
the plastic can deteriorate over time and won't withstand a crash because all it's there for is to protect your kid, which is the most important thing in your life. Also, be wary of used car seats if you don't know the background of the car seat. Once a car seat is in a crash, even if it's a fender bender, it might need replacing depending on the manufacturer. So know your car seat manufacturer, know your heights and weight restrictions, read your manual. (laughs) Learning more about your car seat and how to use your car seat, I think, is the most important thing. But isn't it cooler to have your child forward facing? Like, don't they look cooler? I I honestly don't know what the reason is why people turn their kids around soon. That's what I've heard from people. I think it's easier to put them in the car, maybe. Mm, Not really. Well, I I mean, I think that's what people think it's easier. (laughs) Now, this is funny because a lot lot of people say, oh, well, we've been doing this since blah, 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 and we're all fine. That's what everybody always says when there's a new update for safety of any kind. There's a video of my mom putting me in the car seat in the 90s. I saw this and I freaked out. (laughs) I'm in like this weird looking car seat that almost looks like the one in the episode. Really flimsy, kind of looks like a high chair or piece of a high chair. And she sticks me in the front seat forward facing and I was... And you weren't even tight in there and... No. You're just flopping around basically. Sitting in the seat. Yeah. But I mean, let's talk about car seats from when you were a kid. You want to know what my car seat was? What, sitting on the seat? <laughs> yep. And, you know, that's why people had a lot of kids back then. Also, um, as far as rear-facing to forward-facing, also people put their kids in booster seats too soon. There's tons of stories of kids using the seatbelt too early. You want to keep them in a five-point harness as long as possible when they're forward-facing. And there's no real age for when a kid can go to a booster seat. It's more of their maturity, if they can sit still the whole time. And I think it's around four or five. But not two. No. And also four or five is like the earliest and it's still not recommended that you do it at four or five. I think it's basically all based on your kid. And with booster seats, they have to be able to sit up. And if they fall asleep, they need to still be sitting up because the seatbelt has to go across their body. You don't want it across their stomach. You want it across their hips. You don't want it to hurt them because There was another story, I don't remember, it was a while ago I read it about a mom whose three-year-old had internal bleeding from the seatbelt because she stopped short and the seatbelt actually hurt her and she should have been in a five-point harness. So there's a lot of information out there. Obviously, I'm not going to talk your ear off with car seat safety, but it's something that should definitely be more of an important thing then we're treating it as a society. How many times a day do you put your kid in the car? How many times do you go and you drive for hours with your kid in a car? You might be an awesome driver and not get in any car accidents. But the fact that there are drunk drivers and people texting and driving and people not paying attention or don't care (laughs) driving recklessly on the road, those people aren't driving safe. And it's a two-second thing that could either make or break the rest of your life. I wouldn't want anything to happen to Rennie. And every time I get in the car, I check her car seat to see how tight it is. I check to make sure her straps are tightened enough if I need to tighten them or loosen them depending on what she's wearing. Sometimes if she's wearing like a skirt or something, I have to adjust the way her car seat is. And also, oh, for our northern friends, no bulky jackets in the car. They actually have a car seat jacket that's kind of like a poncho or the back of it lifts up. But you don't want puffy jackets because in a car accident, those compress and your kid could slide right out of the harness. So I think those are the most important topics of car seat safety that I briefly covered. And most importantly, if you're a parent and you love your child, take a good hour of your life and do research on your own to find out more about child safety because a couple minutes here or there doing the right thing might save your child's life. Yeah, some good resources. Um, Thecarseatlady.com. She has like pictographs and all sorts of cool things. And it's all about forward facing, booster seats, rear facing, all sorts of car seat information. Also, Car Seats for the Littles has a blog. They have tons of information as well as they have a Facebook group with certified car seat techs that can help you. Um, The Baby Guy NYC, he's on Facebook. He's also a certified car seat tech and he posts a lot of stuff about car seats also, but he posts a lot about all sorts of baby stuff. But yeah, do your research. There's tons of different things. There's also one that is floating around Facebook right now. It's actually kind of sad. The title is Why Didn't Anyone Tell Me? 
And it's about a mom who didn't think twice about her child's car seat safety, had her 11 month old forward facing, and the story doesn't end well. So she's also trying to promote car seat safety because she just didn't know. And that's a big reason why we're talking about it today. I know a lot of our listeners probably didn't want to hear about car seat safety today, but a lot of people don't know. I didn't know. And I'm glad that I know. And I tried to tell all my friends. I actually had one of my friends text me yesterday and said, I need all the information you have about car seats because my niece is not properly in the car and they want to turn her forward facing and she just turned a year old. So I got all my handy dandy links out and I sent them to her. And hopefully, ultimately, it's not up to you to parent someone else's child, but to educate them and help them learn when they didn't know any better. You can't go wrong there. And if you see it and you don't say anything and something happens, it would eat you alive. So I really understand people that don't know any better. But once people have the information and they don't care and they say stuff like, "Eh, she'll be okay, he'll be okay." I don't understand that. And I don't think I ever will. I guess uh, there's that it'll never happen to me mentality. Or just because I'm a good driver, it means everybody around me is a good driver as well. A lot of people still text and drive because they don't think it'll happen to them. Speaking of that, that new app that AT&T has is awesome. Except that it doesn't work for iMessage. So it needs it needs some improvements. But AT&T and Verizon also have, they have apps for iPhone and Android that's called Drive Mode, I believe. It's a step in the right direction, though. Right. I like the concept. What it does is an auto reply. If anybody texts you and says, hey, I'm driving right now, you can make it say whatever you want. But hey, I'm driving right now. I'll text you when I get to a safe location, which I want it to work for my phone and it doesn't. Only bad part right now is it cuts out my Bluetooth so I can't listen to a podcast and have it work. It's weird. It's cool because it auto activates when you are going faster than 15 miles per hour. So you don't have to think about it and turn it on. But it doesn't work for iMessage. It works for SMS messages on the iPhone. But if you are an iPhone user, it doesn't work for iMessages, which I don't like that. Maybe Apple will get with that soon. I feel like there should be a setting somewhere in the iPhone that says like has an auto respond because I would like that if we were podcasting or taking a nap. Hey, I'm sleeping. I'll text you later. Should be a thing. Someone get on that. One of our listeners make that happen and let us know. (laughs) So again, we are not experts, so don't go by our information. Please find a certified car seat expert in your area or join one of these Facebook groups or do your research online and make sure you're up to date with all the laws because these statements are made, of course, when we record them and this podcast will be out there forever. So always check for updates. Yeah. And just because it's legal doesn't mean it's the recommended safe option. Um, A lot of the car seat texts are trying to get it to be illegal in all 50 states to forward face your child before two. Should be. Right. Um, And in some states it is. The new car seat law in Florida says that children under the age of five have to be in a booster seat or a car seat. They have to be in a car seat. And then ages six and up should be in a belt. But that's the law. That's not what is recommended. And if your child doesn't fit the five point test, I think that's the test that makes sure that you're child can sit in just a seatbelt because you want the belt part of the seatbelt, the lap belt part to go over the tops of their legs close to their stomach, but like on their hips, you don't want it on their stomach or it can hurt them internally if there was a car accident. So always look up the current recommendations and be up to date on car seat safety with your kids or, or even any other kids that are driving in your vehicle. If you have any questions, you can always send us an email or find me on Facebook or Twitter, and I will send you any information you need. I'm not an expert, but I will definitely point everybody in the right direction. The more you know. And we have some feedback. Feedback, feedback, feedback. These emails will be read by Juan. And this one's from Aaron Brotherhead Moss. Greetings, Quantum Leapers. Finally got done listening to another wonderful podcast. This episode, while I don't recall it being one of my favorites, I did like it, and I enjoyed your guys' coverage of it. You guys made a comment about Al being able to observe time without being there, so why did Sam leap? Maybe I'm wrong, but I always thought Sam was trying to send his image back in time so he could be an impartial observer, much like Al is doing. I could be wrong and confusing it with something else. Also, regarding the psychic at the circus, I think she was supposed to be an actual psychic. I think the reason she was stunned when she saw Sam was that she actually sensed Sam in the other guy's body. Sorry, forgot his name. 
she talked to the actual person before, but now she's sensing something different. Sam's aura or whatever. Finally, as far as a comment that I think Albie made about Sam carrying his deceased brother with him in memory, speaking from personal experience, as I've mentioned before, yes you do, well, can, I know that I do, carry the memory of your missing loved one. It's been 30 years and I still carry the memory of my brother with me today. Anyways, enough about me. As far as your audio drama, it was alright, I'll have to give it another episode to see. One of my main problems with it is that the project seems to give God too much credit for the leaping. It sounds more like a religious group instead of a scientific one. I don't know of any scientist that would be willing to give up control of their project to some mythical god that may or may not exist. I can understand them saying the whole god, time, fate, whatever, since they don't know, but saying that god is controlling them and they're fine with it just didn't sit right with me. Maybe 25 years ago I might have went with it more, but at this point in my life it just seemed kind of forced. But that's just my opinion, I could be wrong. I was wrong once before, so I got divorced. Anyways, please continue on with your wonderful show and I'll continue to listen. Aaron, Brotherhead, Moss. I had the same initial reaction when I read the script for the first episode about Ryan thinking and saying that it was God that was controlling Project Quantum Leap. And uh, after I read it a few more times, I realized that it's probably just Ryan's opinion that it's God. He does say that they theorized it could be God, time, fate, or whatever. But I think Ryan thinks it's God, which goes along with what indications I'm getting from Al and Sam at this point in Quantum Leap that we're covering. When I have a problem with something like that, I'll just just between me and Aaron Brotherhead Moss, what I do when something like that comes up is I replace the word God with either Santa Claus or Dracula. And I try to analyze it and see if it offends me if it was, say, Project Quantum Leap was run by Santa Claus or Dracula. And uh, it wouldn't offend me. At this point, we have Al and Sam that think that God is controlling Project Quantum Leap even though we all as a fan group think it's God, Time, Fate, or whatever. That way it's a little bit more comfortable because it could be anything at this point. We really don't know. Sam and Al could be wrong. But I don't think Project Quantum Leap in our audio drama believes it's God controlling it. I think it's just Ryan that thinks that, which would go along with what Al and Sam think. But um, I personally don't have a problem with Ryan as a character thinking Project Quantum Leap is controlled by God. Time travel, as far as I know, isn't real either. Good point. That's the only thing I'm going to say. So (laughs) time travel is still real to me, damn it. (laughs) Currently in our time in 2015, time travel is not real that we know of that we know of. So that being said, we're watching a fictional show. We have a fictional audio drama. Anything that happens in the story, it is what it is, right? I agree with you. And this one's from Father Beast. As Sam leaps in, he discovers that he has a fear of heights. Really? I would have thought he would have noticed that while hanging off the side of a building as a stuntman on the set of Earthquake. But I suppose I'll let that slide since the plot calls for him to be scared of heights. Problem is that the girl, Eva, gets killed while doing a difficult stunt. Unfortunately, she cannot be deterred from doing this stunt. She has set her heart, her life, and everything that she is to doing this stunt, with people helping or not. She's even the one who wrote to Circus Vargas to bring them back to the big top. Eventually, we learn that Eva dies because her father drops her. Sam is a doctor, so he recognizes that the father, Laszlo, has torn a rotator cuff and simply doesn't have the strength to catch her in the stunt. To complicate matters, Laszlo is still mad at Victor for the death of his mother many, many years ago, even though he probably knows deep down that it wasn't his fault. Laszlo is like so many parents who love their children, but let fear or anger or pride make them forget that they do. It was all three that made Laszlo keep Victor from catching Eva in the original timeline. It takes a moment when Sam demonstrates the father's weakness in his arm by easily holding his hand back for him to let Victor catch his sister, which he really knew all along should be what happened. But then Sam has to do the actual catching, and I am acutely aware as he goes to do this that he has not successfully made this catch in practice yet. The announcer is a master at playing the crowd, drilling into the audience the seriousness and danger of what is going on. I admit, I got caught up in it, as I do with almost every episode of this show. Now, on to Heather's question about Al the Hologram. I can't believe we haven't covered this before, but here goes. Al is not just a figment of Sam's imagination, which is to say, Sam does not receive the image of Al telepathically to his mind or some such. Likewise, 
Al is not limited to seeing what Sam can see and hearing what he can hear. We have seen numerous occasions when Al observes something in one place and comes back to report it to Sam. What happens is that the image of Al is projected back into the past. It is an actual image that is actually present in the past, although it is invisible and inaudible to most people. Little children and animals see the image present just fine, though. If Al was only in Sam's head, these little children and animals would have to be connected to Sam's mind in order for them to see Al. This is not the case. Al has gotten used to being this invisible observer, and I just find it hilarious that he gets creeped out when someone else can sense his presence, as did the psychic in this episode almost detect him. As to limitations, I suppose that Al could re-center on anywhere else in the world at the moment when Sam is, but it would become more problematic the further he got from Sam, because Sam is his anchor in the past. When Sam appears in another time, another person appears in the waiting room. Al supposedly can question him to find out what the date is, and then the imaging chamber can zoom in on Sam. Time within a leap is consistent. Three hours in the past means three hours at Project Quantum Leap. If Al stays up all night with a leapy, then that's time he doesn't spend with Sam. In between leaps, they may fudge the timeline a bit, but within a leap, it's consistent. Similarly, Al can just range around time and see whatever he likes. Without Sam as the anchor in the past, he doesn't get to see anything at all. When they do lock onto Sam, it is locked, only that piece of time is available. Well, that's how I see it anyway. Next time. Is that a baby? Father Beast. Okay, so I knew that as far as the hologram subject goes, I, I knew I was going to get <laughs> comments, which is awesome because I really didn't know. I know that Al is not a figment of Sam's imagination, but... With Sam being the anchor into the past, I figured he had to be like within Sam's proximity for that to work out or that he was kind of seeing the past through Sam, if that makes sense. The way you explained it definitely makes sense. Um, It just wasn't the way that I perceived it. So it's cool to see a different perspective on that. And I'm sure you're more right than I am anyway. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, it's, it's cool to get a different point of view on that. I know that he can be in a different place, obviously, in the show. I just didn't understand why. So that makes sense. I I was expecting Hayden to chime in. So Father Beast, way to go. (laughs) It makes sense, but it still seems a little hanky to me. Well, I think that you were just supposed to watch the show and not question it and just smile and nod as the show went on. And we're just going the deeper level. So we know there isn't a rule book now. No, not a written out one anyway. Only in Don's head. There are many ways to leave feedback for the Quantum Leap Podcast. You can visit our website at quantumleappodcast.com. You can send us emails and mp3s at quantumleappodcast at gmail.com. You can even visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash quantumleappodcast. We are on Twitter at quantumleappod. And we are Instagramming at quantumleappodcast. Our voicemail line is 707-847-6682. And you can always leave us an iTunes review. We haven't gotten any of those recently, so it's time for some five-star iTunes reviews. I agree. You can also sign up for our newsletter at quantumlypodcast.com slash newsletter to get all of our recent updates, and it'll also enter you into our newest giveaway. And we have a winner for our last giveaway. So the winner of our first LaserDisc is J.J. Flanagan Graneman. Congratulations. And we still have one more LaserDisc up for grabs. So sign up at quantumleappodcast.com slash newsletter to enter the giveaway. Anybody that's already signed up for our newsletter is automatically entered into the giveaway. So J.J., just send us your mailing address and we'll get that right on out to you. The prize for part two of our giveaway is the Color of Truth and Kamikaze Kid on LaserDisc. Ooh, good episodes. Yeah. How exciting. And you must have listened to this segment to find out about this giveaway. Well, I think that I think that kind of... That's the only requirement, finding out about it. <laughs> <laughs> we are on Patreon. Thank you very much to all our patrons. To become a patron, you can go to www.patreon.com slash quantumleappodcast. You can be a patron for as little as $1 per episode. And you will not receive an umbrella or tote bag. <laughs> Heather, do you have any news for us? So Deborah Pratt has a new book out. It just came out. It's called The Tempting, Seducing the Nephilim. Wow. What does that mean? It sounds seducing and tempting. Sounds like it's a romance, maybe. 
I'm not really sure what Nephilims are. I think they're some kind of mythical creature. I haven't looked it up yet. But it definitely seems like an interesting story. And she does explain more about her story on Facebook. I think we posted the video earlier this week. Go check it out on our Facebook page or I think on her Facebook page too. Very exciting. Any other news? Actually, yeah. Dean Stockwell is going to be at a convention, which is awesome because I don't think he's been doing that lately. Not a lot. He's going to be at the Mid-Atlantic Nostalgia Convention from September 17th to the 19th, 2015 in Hunt Valley, Maryland. Unfortunately, that is a little far for us to travel. A little bit. To find out more information, you can go to midatlanticnostalgiaconvention.com. We'll have the link in our show notes. And if uh, you guys hear of any appearances by Scott or Dean that you would like us to talk about on the show, just send us a note. Heather, do you have any trivia? A little bit. I noticed, and I know I think you noticed too, the star on the sheriff's car kept moving from one side of the car to the other side of the car. So that's something. A little weird. A little jarring. Kind of weird that the star can hop back and forth. I'm thinking it was magnetic and it kept falling off and they were like, well, I'll put it on this side this time. I was going to say like if the car was at a different shot, they would move it and then like forget to move it back. <laughs> I don't know. Like they only had one star. <laughs> but needed it for both sides. I don't know. <laughs> okay, you're driving this way. Let's move the star. <laughs> it could be. You never know. When the police asked the store owner to describe Sam, he, or Buster, I should say, he says that Buster had a couple days growth, but when we saw him in the mirror, he had like full grown beard. So I think that was maybe more than a couple days. <laughs> it's kind of like the actor was describing Scott instead of describing Buster. Right. Or maybe... They decided to go with a different actor. Could be. Maybe they didn't cast him until after they shot that scene. Yeah. You never know. Who knows? And I know you mentioned Barbie dolls earlier. The Barbie looks like it's from 1960, which we already talked about. But the vinyl cases shown were from 1968, showing a doll with long straight hair and a yellow striped outfit. And 1969, which looked like a wavy blue frame around a doll in a dress. Even though it's commonplace now to give Barbie dolls to baby girls. It was unheard of in 1963. I didn't think you're supposed to give a Barbie to babies because they have like shoes and jewelry that can come off. Right. It's a choking hazard, right? And they're pointy and babies drop stuff and I would, I just wouldn't want to be poked by a Barbie by, I don't know. They can chew the head off and choke on that. Yeah. Barbies I think are four and up. But yeah, their shoes are super tiny. So not a lot of trivia, but some fun, interesting facts. Yeah. Make us go back and watch it again. Man, there's some serious facts about Barbies. Yeah, it's a, it's a serious subject. I had a huge collection of Barbies, and it was uh, started with Star Trek Ken and Barbie. And then whenever they would release a cool movie tie-in Barbie, I would get it. Like, just a $40 action figure. I have still a huge Tupperware bin of Barbies and a Barbie dream house with a moving elevator. That's pretty cool. Are they open? Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, sorry. I was playing with them when I was a kid. You don't want to open them. Yeah. When you're a kid, you do. Oh. I'm not a collector of Barbie. Again, it's got to be your turn. I wonder why she's so cranky tonight. The way we're going, we're never going to get this podcast recorded. We've got a fortune teller here, John. Ziggy says that's exactly what happens. The podcast never gets finished. Well, we better make sure that doesn't happen. I think we could talk now. What are you doing here, Hayden? Don't you usually observe for Juan? Oh, when we found out where you leapt to, I knew I had to come. I've got a special bond with this particular child. Plus, I promised Serenity I'd come back one day. And does Ziggy really think that I'm here just to get a small child to sleep? 86% chance. If Serenity goes to sleep, Albie, your host, and Heather can finish recording the podcast. Ah, here's Serenity's room. Since she knows me, maybe I'd better go first. Heather! See? Told you I'd be back. Tea. Tea? Oh, not tonight, sweetie. Thanks, though. Now, why don't you want to go to sleep? Magic. Oh, the monsters. Well, you're in luck. I've brought a friend of mine. Where did he go? 
This is John Grid. He's the best at spells, and he'll get rid of those monsters in no time. You can come in now. Hi, Serenity. So you need me to finish off some monsters? Piece of cake. Monster Gonster. <laughs> Let me just check a few places. Under the bed. All gone. In the wardrobe. None there either. But if come back. Hmm, what if they come back? What's your favourite animal, Serenity? Thank you. Okay. Well, I'll conjure up a dragon, and he can protect you from any monsters that might ever decide to come back. <laughs> you know we need her to go to sleep, don't you? Uh, one step at a time. Now, Serenity, Toothless gets all his own food, so you don't have to feed him. He's a very special dragon too, because most of the time he's invisible. But he's always here watching over you and keeping the monsters away. Yeah. Think you could go to sleep now? No, no, Bobby. Two and two are four. Four and four are eight. Eight and eight are sixteen. Sixteen and sixteen are thirty-two. Inchworm, inchworm, measuring the marigolds. You and your arithmetic will probably go far. Inchworm, inchworm, measuring the marigolds. Seems to me you'll stop and see how beautiful they are. <coughs> wow, that worked a little <coughs> too well. <coughs> ah well, let them both sleep. Leaping takes a lot out of you, <coughs> and John really could use some well-earned R&R. &R. Okay, I'll go check on it. <coughs> Uh-oh. Heather looks bored. She might be on the brink of giving up and going to bed. Well, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. I'll finish off this podcast myself. In most long-running series, it's usually required to do clip shows, mostly to save enough money to squeeze another episode out in a season. Some people see clip shows as a slap in the face, while others see them as a chance to reminisce over and enjoy some of their favourite moments from a series. Personally, I'm in the latter. Some of my favourite episodes of some of my favourite series are clip shows. As long as the wraparound story is strong, a clip show can feel every bit as new and exciting as a brand new episode of that series. Charmed is a prime example. They did some amazing clip shows, two of which are some of my favourite episodes of the whole series. In the first, Piper and Leo attend marriage counselling, and Piper has to cast a spell so that she and Leo could look into the past to more vividly remember some of the greatest moments of their romantic story. Unfortunately, the spell accidentally transports Phoebe and Paige back in time, so they have to relive these memories without changing anything, which was difficult considering that the warlock they were battling at the time also got transported to the past. In the second, Phoebe and Paige are accidentally exposed doing their magic in front of a detective, and any memories of the magic in that event had to be erased by the cleaners. Unfortunately, removing all magic from everyone's memories ended up incriminating their friend in the murder of one of the victims, and the Charmed Ones have to plead their case to a magical tribunal to try and restore the original sequence of events to save their friend. They are immediately put on trial for being reckless with their magic, and both the defence and the prosecution, led by the Demon of Fear, are able to magically replay events from the past to back up their cases. Both of these episodes are fantastic, because not only is the writing gripping, but they chose some great moments to replay, thus reminding us of how great the show was and still is. Another show which did an amazing clips episode was Third Rock from the Sun, 
in which the family of aliens discussed the seven deadly sins. And even though they believed they were above such human flaws, they looked back over their time on Earth and found they'd succumbed to all of them in some of the funniest moments ever shown on TV. The very best clip show I've ever seen, though, is The Simpsons 128th Episode Spectacular, which was presented by Troy McClure as a special behind-the-scenes look at the show The Simpsons itself. The producers of The Simpsons have stated that they were not happy about having to do a clip show, and so they decided to do an episode that didn't feel like a clip show at all. The episode was very clever, as its humour was very tongue-in-cheek. And while it did break the fourth wall, it still felt authentic. What they chose to show as clips had either never been aired before, deleted scenes from older episodes and the alternate endings to Who Shot Mr. Burns, or else not aired as part of the series itself, so clips from the Tracy Allman show. As a result, it's hard to think of this episode as anything other than a new episode, and a hilarious one at that. Really, what makes a clip show great is having a decent theme to write around, choosing great moments from the series to replay, and gripping writing for the wraparound story. The closest that we ever got to a clip show in Quantum Leap were the episodes Shock Theatre and Mirror Image. But even they were unique, because in Shock Theatre, even though Sam took on the personas of people he'd leapt into before and saw himself with their mirror images, uh, thus reminding us of those episodes, they did not reuse any footage. And Mirror Image again was unique because without reusing much footage, many of the people Sam met were doppelgangers for people he'd met during past leaps, thus reminding him and the viewers of those past leaps and helping him realise what he was there to do. It is strange that for a series that ran as long as Quantum Leap did, that they never tried to do a traditional clip show. There was no shortage of quality footage that could be reused, And in a show that's all about putting things right that once went wrong, you have the perfect lead-in, that Sam or someone else may have to leap back to these events that have already been affected, either to learn something or to fix some other mistakes that might have occurred. There are several loose ends in Quantum Leap that the show never tied up. One loose end in particular gives a great lead-in for a possible clip show, at least in my head. There is an episode of Quantum Leap where Sam leaps into an old man who has been researching UFO sightings and Sam leapt in at the exact moment to witness one himself. As a result, he, just like his counterpart in the waiting room, also became obsessed with proving the existence of UFOs. Unfortunately, his host was being watched by government agents, who capture and interrogate him about what he knows. To be sure he's telling the truth, they inject him with sodium pentothal, and while under the truth serum, Sam tells them all about Project Quantum Leap. It's never confirmed what happened to Sam's confession tapes, but in my opinion, this is the perfect way to write in a clip show. The way I see it, a theme that wasn't ever addressed in the show, but could easily have been, was the ethical ramifications of time travel. Whether the risk of creating unforeseeable changes on the present by altering the past was outweighed by the potential benefits of putting right what once went wrong. The government, with the knowledge of the project from the confession under sodium pentothal, could have decided to keep a very close eye on Sam and the project. Either the government could create their own version of the time travel project, or else eventually deciding that they have to intervene at Project Quantum Leap. Either way, a government agent could be sent back in time to investigate the changes that Sam Beckett had done to the timeline. This could easily facilitate the use of a great deal of stock footage, while at the same time reminding the viewers of how great the show is, and also how much good Sam had done. Obviously, the government would rule in Sam's favour after seeing all the good that he's done, and this could even potentially end the project's worries about funding, as it could end up government-funded. It could even create some interesting storylines to build up on, should the government or some other source get their hands on the project's technology and use it for their own purposes. Until next time, make sure to look before you leap, weigh up all possibilities and consequences, and in the end, think, what would Sam Beckett do? Aw, that was adorable, Albie. You and Serenity both fast asleep, her in your arms. <sighs> it must have been a lot more tired than I thought. I'm just glad I got a picture of it before you woke up. I wouldn't have believed you if I hadn't seen the picture. 
I have no memory of going into Rennie's room and helping her fall asleep. Really? Yeah, I do remember having a crazy dream, though. I was in a bright white room and I was all alone. I thought maybe I died, but Hayden showed up and told me everything was going to be okay and that I'd be home soon. It was it was kind of weird. So it, you had a dream about Hayden and not me? You think that's bad? He even sang me a lullaby. Inchworm, inchworm, measuring the marigolds. Oh no, please tell me you're not going to start on that one. <laughs> Here's to hoping when we go on the boat, there's a shrink on board to check you out. There usually is a ship's doctor, I think. Are you excited, Heather, for the next episode of Quantum Leap? Always. Next time, we will be talking about Sea Bride. Sam leaps into Philip Dumont on board the ocean liner, the Queen Mary. Philip's ex-wife, Catherine Farrington, is on board in a wedding dress. And then the fun begins. Quantum leaping always leaves me with an unsteady feeling, but this is ridiculous. Oh, Philip! Why the hell are you here? Oh, boy. You were supposed to be dead. I knew it wasn't true. But if it wasn't true, why didn't you come home? Then get your dukes up. I really think that there's been some mistake here. Oh, well, not yet, but there's going to be if you Only don't if stop you try and Catherine, stop Catherine from, from marrying, marrying Vincent. Vinny the Viper. Vinny the Viper. According to Ziggy, there's an 88.3% probability that you are here to prevent this wedding from taking place. Well, Ziggy's wrong. Originally, Philip was unable to stop the wedding, so he committed suicide. Catherine could never get over it, so two years later she died of a broken heart. Anyway, he was talking to that henchman he calls a best man, and he told him if you step one foot near Kate... That's short for Catherine. He's going to chop you up into little tiny pieces and feed you to the fish. That little waltz may have just cost you your life. Look, I don't want to shoot you. Good. I'm going to marry Catherine tomorrow. And I don't want you getting her all confused with a lot of stuff from the past. I can appreciate that. And I'm sure you can appreciate that. I just want to make sure that she's not confused about the present. And this one has Beverly Leach in it. So you can finally listen to that interview. Woohoo! I was a little confused by um, the leap in. We, we, we watched the leap in because obviously he's not a professor again. So we did watch the leap in to the sea bride. I was a little confused why a woman in a wedding dress would be kissing a man and then smacking him. So I guess it's something about a mob, I think, right? It should be interesting. Until next time, I'm Albie. And I'm Heather. When measuring the marigolds, the metric system is far superior to the inchworm. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Quantum Leap Podcast. Go to quantumleappodcast.com and listen to new episodes. The Quantum Leap Podcast is not affiliated with Belisarius Productions or Universal TV. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get behind-the-scenes information, exclusive content, and to be notified first when new episodes are available. To support the podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash quantumleappodcast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash quantumleappodcast. The thoughts and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual and do not necessarily represent or reflect those of the Quantum Leap Podcast, Baron Space Productions, its partners, or affiliates. Quantum Leap Podcast is edited by Albie, John Buchanan, and Juan. Researched by Juan. Contributors Hayden McQueenie and Jill Arroway. Voice talent provided by John Buchanan, Tony Fennerin, and Juan. The co-producer for the Quantum Leap Podcast is Hayden McQueenie, and Juan is the line producer. The Quantum Leap Universe and all it contains is property of Belisarius Productions and Universal TV. No infringement is intended. The Quantum Leap Podcast is a barren space production. Meanwhile, Reed is still on Bunny's trail, assuring... Why are you laughing about Bunny's trail? Um, I think it's a good thing. I think what Bunny and... I think what Buster Bunny, uh, another thing, remember I was talking, remember in the last episode I had mentioned, (laughs) it's like your Twitter thing all over again. (laughs) As promised earlier, we have this inner, we have an, it's all very noble, but why should my company, (laughs) company, (laughs) Philip's ex-wife, Catherine Farrington is on board in a wedding dress and, uh, the shenanigans ensues. You said two plurals. The shenanigans ensues. <sighs> Ensue? Like if you said in shenanigan, you've said one shenanigan. 
It would be ensues. You said ensues. That's not a noun, though. It's a verb. Something starts. You wouldn't say start. The shenanigans and start. I guess yeah, you, you would. would. A plural and then a singular. And then the fun begins. Can you say one? Two. <laughs> At least she knows what comes after one. <laughs>